Good evening. Uh, welcome to the June 20, 2006 meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board. Uh, meeting is now called to order. Uh, the first item on our agenda is a review and approval of the minutes from our prior meeting of May 16, 2006. First, are there any comments or questions concerning the minutes from our last meeting? Seeing none, do I have a motion? The motion's been made by Mr. Griffin, sir, seconded by Jack Keneally. Any further discussion? All those in favor? A motion carries. Included among our correspondence this evening is a letter from L. Newton regarding Spurwink Woods, a South Street Wetland Assessment regarding Spurwink Woods, the Lincoln Institute Resource Kit, a letter from the town attorney regarding dead end road standards, a letter from the town attorney regarding the Elliott Private Accessway Permit, and a letter from R. Parker regarding Cross Hill. In addition, we have received via email today a number of letters, emails uh, from parties regarding Spurwink Woods. Uh, if you want to ensure that your letter is part of the record, you are certainly free to check in with the town planner. Um, but we have received them by email, and they have also been printed out for us tonight, so we do have them as part of our record. Uh, the first item on our agenda is uh, whether or not the board wishes to schedule a site walk for a resource protection permit located on Alder Street and 3 Cheveris Road. Uh, we had had a, a uh, workshop uh, earlier this month, and what we are hoping, in the interest of full disclosure to the applicant, is to avoid having the applicant spend a lot of money on developing a plan only to not have it get approved. And we can't guarantee approval, of course, but we had conveyed a message to the applicant that this might be something that the board is willing to consider upon further reflection. And in seeing some letters from the abutters, I think it would be prudent to go out there and review the property before this applicant goes too far down the road in developing plans. Does anybody have any other comments on that? People in agreement? Jim, did, did you want to come up with a date? Then we'd be happy to try to do this quickly so you could move this along. Great. I appreciate that. Um, if there's anything available the remaining days of this week, um, after hours, or Saturday morning, that would work out wonderfully for us. OK. Uh, would the majority of the planning board members be able to do something in the evening this week or Saturday, first thing Saturday morning? I don't think it would take too long. <coughs> and on Saturday morning? Okay. Uh, we, I know we're up against Little League issues for some of us. Uh, I know Thursday is free for me. Would that work for others? Can we do it at 5, five o'clock? I, I can't do Thursday, but if I'm the only one. How many can do Thursday at 5? David, can you do that? OK. So we have at least five of us. Perhaps Jack and Peter could get together with the town planner or just go down on your own. OK, so Thursday at 5 o'clock? Excellent. I might suggest that uh, you, you, it's going to be easier to park on Alder Street, which is the street that actually is the frontage for the, loca, the proposed locus. Uh, Chevers, if you parked up on Chevers on Ms. Radigan's side, you'd end up having to walk all the way around. So certainly wherever you wish, but it might be e more easily accessible there. Five o'clock on uh, Thursday. Thursday. Thank, Thank you very thanks much. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Barbara? I may be going somewhere after. It's very muddy and everything there. It's pretty wet, isn't it? Um, it's wet inside. You know, it depends on how deeply. It, it's very easy to see just about the entire lot from standing on the pavement. Okay. I mean, it's not too difficult. So. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, the first item on our agenda is actually a consent agenda item, the Manning Subdivision Amendment. Uh, Martha and Richard Manning are requesting an amendment to the Highlands Subdivision to expand the building envelope for the lot located at 2 Heritage Court to include a portion of the existing home, Section 16-2-5 Subdivision Amendment. We did have a workshop regarding this application, and it appeared from the members of the planning board that they were inclined to approve this as a consent agenda item, though if anybody would like to have any substantive discussion, we would have to take it off the consent agenda. Are there any questions? 
Maureen, have there been any, been any comments from any of the abutters? I do recall one abutter did uh, indicate that they had no problem with the change. Um, so in light of that, do we have a motion, Barbara? Motion for the board to consider be in order that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Richard and Martha Manning for an amendment to the previously approved Highlands at Broad Cove subdivision to amend the building envelope so that the existing home is completely within the building envelope with a lot located at 2 Heritage, Heritage Court be approved. Is there a second? Second. Uh, Paul has seconded the motion. Any further discussion? All those in favor? The motion carries. Thank you. The uh, next item is also a consent agenda item, uh, Two Lights Professional Center Site Plan Extension. Wiley Enterprises is, is requesting a one-year extension of the site plan approval granted by the Planning Board for the Two Lights Professional Center, a 6,000 square foot mixed-use office multifamily residential building located on Davis Point Lane. This request will be considered under Section 19-9-4, subparagraph B4 site plan review procedures. Again, this is on the consent agenda. If anybody on the board would like to have any substantive discussion, we would have to have a motion to move it off the consent agenda. Any questions or concerns regarding this one? In light of that, is there a motion? John. Be in order that based on the request submitted, oh. the request of the Wiley Enterprises to extend the approval for the Two Lights Professional Center a 6,000 square foot mixed use office multifamily residential building to be located on Davis Point Road be extended to June 20th, 2007. Motion has been made. Is there, is there a second? It's been seconded by Jack. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Okay, motion carries. Under old business, we actually had as the last item on the agenda the Elliott Private Access Way Permit, Resource Protection Permit. Uh, and my understanding uh, from the memorandum we received is that we did schedule a public hearing for tonight. Unfortunately, public notice and the legal ad and notices that would be normally mailed to the abutters was not given at least a week before our meeting tonight. Uh, which would mean that if we proceeded, we would not be in compliance with the ordinance. I believe the applicant has been informed of this and the likelihood that we would have a motion to table this until the July 18th meeting. Given those circumstances, is there a motion for the board? Uh, Jack. Um, motion for the board to consider be in order that based on the plans and materials submitted, the application of Don Elliott for a private access way permit and resource protection permit to make the lot located at 43 Hennep Cove a buildable lot and construct a driveway across an RP2 wetland be tabled to the July 18, 2006 meeting, at which time a public hearing will be held. The motion has been made. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Paul. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor? The motion carries. The next item and the final item under old business is the Spurwink Woods subdivision. Spurwink Woods LLC is requesting final subdivision review, a resource protection permit, and amendments to two previously approved subdivisions for Spurwink Woods a 42-lot unit subdivision proposed for the area between Dermot Drive and Kildeer Road. The application includes 19 condominiums and 23 single-family homes, excuse me, single-family home lots on 24.97 acres. The application will be reviewed for compliance with Section 16-2-4 subdivision regulations, Section 16-2-5 amendments to previously approved subdivisions, and Section 19-8-3 resource protection regulations. At this point, I would ask the applicant to step forward and summarize any changes uh, to the project that have been made since our last meeting. Thank you. Uh, 
My name is John Mitchell, Mitchell & Associates, and I represent uh, Swinwick Woods, LLC. Uh, I'd like to, this evening, I'd like to just review <coughs> our submission, our latest submission package uh, dated June 2nd, 2006. And uh, I'm also going to ask uh, Tom Goral of Goral Palmer, the traffic engineer, to summarize his uh, traffic analysis for the revised plan. Included in our submission um, is a revised plan. It's labeled Option A, um, and it sh shows the gate, the emergency gate located on Chicory Way in this location here with the proposed uh, hammerhead turnaround. Uh, this, is, this is the preferred plan um, and is the one that we are proposing. <clears throat> Our reason for this, for this change, um, relates to the possibility of connecting to the Maxwell uh, property at some point in the future, as well as the, the vote um, at uh, June 13th uh, for the referendum for the shortcut. Um, if in that case, if the gate were to be placed on South Street, um, and if this connection were to be made through the Maxwell property, um, the road would be um, considered a cut-through road uh, in, with the new ordinance. Additionally, by locating the gate uh, at Chicory Way, uh, there will be no traffic associated with this project that goes through the Columbus Road and therefore uh, no need for traffic calming measures such as sidewalks or trees. And we feel that, um, we believe that the planning board uh, should <clears throat> plan for this eventuality so that a new cut through road can be avoided uh, if the Maxwell property is, is developed. I'd like to just review with the board uh, the advantages uh, that we, um, that we see for the option A gate plan uh, located at, on Chicory Way. The first, it allows vehicular interconnectivity between the Spurwick Woods and the South Portland Estates neighborhood. It allows through traffic within the Spurwick Woods development. Uh, if the gate were to be located here, this, uh, the residents of the single family homes could not travel to the condominiums. It eliminates uh, any Spurwick Woods traffic through the Mitchell Highlands neighborhood. It elim eliminates any cut-through traffic uh, through the Mitchell Highlands neighborhood as well as the South Portland Estates neighborhood. It reduces the total number of proposed peak hour trips at the Spurwick Avenue Stevenson Street intersection by approximately 37 percent. It allows for interconnectivity for pedestrians and bicycle traffic between all three neighborhoods. Um, and if and when the road connection through the Maxwell property is constructed, it will create a loop road providing two means of access onto Spinwick Road. Um, Tom Goral has uh, included a revised traffic analysis based on option A, and he'll summarize that in a few minutes. Um, we have included in our packet a detail of the emergency gate. Um, I communicated with uh, Bob Malley and uh, got his, uh, uh, what his desires for, for this gate and designed a gate accordingly, and that's included in your packet. Uh, as requested by the board at the last meeting, we have uh, prepared a schematic sidewalk plan for the Columbus Road neighborhood, um, and that is included in your packet as an 11 by 17, and that takes into consideration the existing uh, conditions. And uh, also included in our packet is a revised uh, meets and bounds descriptions for the, for the open space. Uh, as you remember, we've increased the total amount of open space to 12.5 acres. And so we've revised the meets and bounds description on that. So at this point, I'd like to ask Tom Goral to summarize his plan. We also have Al Palmer here, Goral Palmer, 
who prepared the stormwater management plan. And um, if you have any questions regarding the stormwater management plan, uh, please ask uh, Al to speak to that. Thank you. And thank you. And before we hear from Mr. Goral, I just wanted to remind the uh, planning board members that the town's attorney is here tonight. In the event that any of us feels that there is a legal issue that we need advice on, we can convene in an executive session for that purpose. Okay, go ahead, thanks. Mr. Chairman and members of the board, I'm Tom Goral with Goral Palmer. As you know, we had completed the traffic study uh, for the proposed uh, project. With the change to option A, which is a gate in Chicory Way, um, I just wanted to summarize for you a little bit in terms of what that means for changes in traffic flow. With option A, the gate in Chicory Way, the traffic associated with the development will be heading out towards the Stevenson Spurwink intersection. The traffic study had estimated that during the PM peak hour, there would be 33 trips entering the site and 18 exiting for a total of 51 trip ends. Um, that figure is conservative to begin with in that we treated the condominiums, the, port, the condominium portion as single family homes for the purposes of estimating trip generation. Not normally done, but we wanted to be conservative. So if anything, that's a high number. By going ahead and using that number, um, that 51 compares with uh, the 43 that we had estimated uh, going out to Stevenson when the uh, proposal was uh, previously presented. But in addition to the 43, which was due to the development, uh, there was also an estimated, along the way here, we had estimated a maximum, we thought, of 38 uh, trips for our cut through traffic, but also reassignment of some of the traffic, the existing traffic that's in the Columbus Road, uh, Mitchell Highlands neighborhood. So based on the uh, traffic study that you had when you granted preliminary approval, there was a potentially up to 81 trip ends at uh, Stevenson and Spurwick. Under this proposal, there would be 51, and there won't be any, as John had said, obviously, going out Columbus. So those are the changes. Um, we would obviously continue to recommend that there be some mitigation at the intersection of Spurwink with Stevenson. And we've talked about various options there before, and I think we remain flexible on that. Um, obviously something we should address that in some way. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think that, that pretty much summarizes our, our submission package and, uh, uh, you know, we obviously we've worked very diligently with the board for the past 12 months on this project and uh, we truly hope that the board will take final action on this this evening. Thank you. Thank you. The uh, issue of the, well, let me back up. Uh, given the recent uh, town referendum that was voted uh, uh, or approved by the voters uh, last week, we need to place a gate somewhere within this uh, proposed development. And it seems to me the issue that we really ought to grapple with first is where it goes, because depending on where it goes, a lot of the other issues may become moot. If the members of the board were inclined to go along with option A, then obviously the traffic calming measures for the Columbus Road neighborhood would become unnecessary. So I, and I, I believe there are other impacts uh, as well. Uh, the uh, landscaping on Mr. Moran's property would not be necessary. Uh, and so I think we ought to deal with that issue first. And I'd be curious to hear, A, if the board members have more questions for the applicant, but B, what, what their thoughts are on that. Uh, no, David? I just wanted to make a quick comment. Uh, seeing, seeing the two proposals, I'm inclined to go with uh, uh, the gate on Chicory uh, for a couple of reasons, but I think the main reason is that when we did the site walk, uh, Columbus 
not all the residents were in favor of the sidewalk. And if we put the gate in the other location, we'll have to deal with that. And I think that can be a serious problem. So I think putting it on chicory uh, would, would be my choice. Okay. <clears throat> Barbara, you had your hand up. Well, I was going to ask about traffic calming measures on Stevenson and, and um, uh, Dermot, but I'll state my opinion. I think this is a landlocked piece of land that does not have good ingress and egress. I think putting all the traffic out to Stevenson and Hamlin is totally unfair. Um, those people were much less vocal except for one person, but there are people who do live there. We talk about 51 trip ins. The report also said that that is for the one peak hour AM and PM and that typically traffic is 10 times that. That's 510 cars approximately, more, and it'll be more or less, we can't know exactly, going in and out of a tiny, tiny little street. And that really doesn't seem very safe to me, and it doesn't seem very fair to me. And I am not in favor. I'm not, I only said I'd, go, I'd be in favor of the gate. I don't think it's a very good tool to use um, because it was the only way it seemed to resolve it. And the fairest way to resolve it, which also leads to other problems, is to put it in the middle so the traffic is divided half and half. I do not think it's a good idea to force all the traffic out one way. Well, Barbara, let me just ask the question. If indeed the placement of the gate on Chicory Way has the net effect of decreasing the trip ends in and out of the Stevenson area, then why is that necessarily poor, poor planning? I understand this notion of fairness, and I think all along when we thought about a gate, we thought, oh, well, it just makes sense to put it in the middle. Um, but as we now look at the, the traffic studies and deal with all the other factors, I'm really questioning this, that fairness, I don't know if that's the, right word, if that's the right word, I think what's the best planning for this development, and if it decreases traffic at that intersection, then why? It doesn't why? decrease the traffic. When the plan was originally proposed, there was nothing about cut through. It was the plan of how many people would go in one way or out one way, and how many people would go in one way and out the other way. I went back to the original traffic study that didn't take into consideration cut through. So let's not talk about decreasing. It doesn't decrease. It takes all the traffic that would go out through Columbus Road, and it forces it out through Stevenson. I mean, it's logical. You can't decrease when you've got one way out. It's not possible. We can talk about cut-through traffic, but if you eliminate the cut-through and you go back to the original proposal, now we've done away with cut-through. The town, the town residents have spoken and said, we don't want cut-through traffic. We don't like that idea. You destroy existing neighborhoods. So I, if you go back to the original proposal, you're not decreasing traffic going out. Nobody's going to convince me you are, because you've got to get those people out one way now instead of two. Right. How is that bad planning? I mean, because, well, you don't, you really want to, I, go ahead. You really want to hear what I have to say? I, I don't know if anybody's going to like this very well. I think that in concept, open space planning works very well for some parcels of land. In my opinion, for this parcel of land, I don't think it works very well. And I think there was a much better way to do it. And the way to do it was to have fewer houses, put restrictive covenants on those on every lot, have absolutely enforced um, boundaries, building envelopes that nobody could go out of, require that trees remain, require that they be replaced if they were not. I, I mean, if you really want to hear what I think, I, I am not in favor of this parcel of land. There, the land is going to be basically clear cut. And nobody wants to hear me say that. But everybody knows that I've had feelings about it from the very beginning. So, I, and I probably stand alone, which is fine. I mean, I have, to, I have to look at that in terms of what I think the best plan would have been. And, and, and I want to say that Mitchell and Associates has done an outstanding job. I have no question about your fine, excellent planners and site developers. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with this land being locked in between two existing areas. And this plan doesn't work very well to me. And I'm sorry, I, 
I have to say, I wouldn't have developed it as, open sp as an open space zone. It didn't have to be. It wasn't required on this piece of land, and I would have done it differently. Well, you are more than welcome to speak up at any time. Uh, uh, so don't, no, that's fine. Uh, does anybody, I want to try to stay focused, though, on the issue of the gate location. I don't know if, Peter, you were chiming in a bit. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I'm, 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 I'm troubled by the, uh, the chicory way because of the potential for the Maxwell sort of logic. If it goes, if it doesn't go there, it goes uh, in the other, in option B, there is nothing that stops it from being moved if and when, and maybe I should ask Maureen this, if and when any other parcels are developed. I don't see that as necessarily following. Meaning, I think we should have what we have, we should uh, look at the project that we have in front of us, consider the future option, but, but also consider that that might never happen. But more importantly, because, you know, for good or bad, we now have this ordinance to deal with, and frankly, some flexibility within it. It's not, you know, I think it does grant the board some discretion. Anything in the future, that gate could be moved to address the problem at that time. And frankly, since we don't know the dimensions or uh, the scale or whatever else is going in in that site, how could we begin to sort of say, well, we're going to put this here because something may be down the line and the Maxwell property may, may dictate that this is a good place for that right now. I, I, don't, I don't see that at all. I guess I look at this project and say, where's the best from a town planning perspective, taking into consideration the neighbor's concerns, because they deal with it immediately, but it is a town issue, a town planning issue, where's the best spot for it? And I guess I don't see it on Chicory Way right now. That's, you know, later on that might be a better place for it, but that's because of some future project. So my, my inclination would not be in that location. Okay. Actually, my inclination is not to have it at all, but I've lost Well, <laughs> so is mine, but Sorry. that's life. Uh, Paul? <laughs> I agree with Peter. I don't want to get caught too, caught too far trying to figure out what's going to happen in the future, but if we hypothesize for a second, if the Maxwell property were, to, were ultimately de developed, um, the way the recent vote has gone, I would have to imagine that the, we, we'd have to put up something so that we wouldn't allow traffic from um, you know, the Columbus Road neighborhood to be able to come down into the Maxwell property and, and, and out onto Spurwink Avenue. So that to me, that's to me that's a reality that I think we need to that we need to keep partially in our in our mind. Um, and I also, again, I'm just I'm at the I'm asking the question, Mr. Chair. I also understand the way the the, the, the vote is is that if there is a connection through the Maxwell property out to Spurwink, that this loop uh, South Street does not constitute a cut through way. Is that is that is, is that a correct? Understanding that is my understanding of the newly enacted ordinance that if we had a loop road uh, that would connect South Street and continue through the Maxwell property back onto Spurwink, that would not be a cut through road, that would be a loop road, which would be permissible under the new ordinance. Okay, um, okay, well, again, just keeping all those things in consideration, I, 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 I agree in principle that I think sharing the burden of this. Uh, this development should be done uh, amongst both neighborhoods and not just one. So uh, again, given um, given that, I think my inclination right now is is is, is to favor option B. I'd like to see a shared uh, burden of the of, of the traffic on the two neighborhoods versus just one. John, yeah, I would I would say that that would be my inclination as well, leaving some amount of flexibility to change it at some later date if and when other things happen. I think that's the right. Yeah, which I, I think we'd be, well, obviously we'd be required to. If there just magically happened to be another development that came along tomorrow that made a connection through Mitchell out to Spurwink, we'd be looking at not allowing the connection from the Columbus Road neighborhood into, the, into a, a new development. But that's, you know, again, don't, again, don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves, but that's, that, that's a reality that somebody may have to face. Peter? And this is off the subject, but on at the same time. It's, the option B puts the issue of traffic calming and sidewalks squarely on the table. And frankly, the sidewalks to me are, are good planning. And that's where, uh, 
in, in terms of what's good for the town, as difficult as it is for the neighbors, it's a town benefit that I personally would not want to squander in this project by going with the option that would say, well, now we don't have to confront that because there's not going to be any reason to change that neighborhood at all. And, and uh, I, I look at it from the town's perspective, it is better for the town to confront that now, not, you know, to ignore it. The, we heard uh, John Mitchell lay out the advantages to putting the gate on Chicory Way. I had actually jotted them, many of the same ones down myself. If we are decreasing the peak hour trips at the Stevenson and Spurwink intersection, that is a plus. We're maintaining the integrity of the new neighborhood. We're not putting a new neighborhood in this town and then dividing it in two and not allowing access from one side to the other. That just doesn't make any sense to me. The gate doesn't either, but we have to live with that. Uh, sidewalks, I believe, already exist on Dermot Drive and Hamlin. Uh, there would not be the same level of disruption as from, a, from the perspective of capital improvements <laughs> as there would be to the Mitchell Highlands neighborhood. Uh, we have heard from residents of that neighborhood, some like the sidewalks, some don't. Uh, but if we did place the gate on Chicory Way, there would be no need to make any changes to the Mitchell Highlands subdivision. Uh, I understand the hesitation of the board to rely on the Maxwell Street potentially being developed, excuse me, the Wax Maxwell property potentially being developed, but we need to take into account planning for the future, and that parcel is there, and we did preserve the ability for that roadway to continue on through the Maxwell property, and that would create a loop road. Uh, it just seems to me it's a much better planning, uh, it's much better planning for the town of Cape Elizabeth to put the gate in at Chicory Way. Uh, I understand this notion of fairness, but I'm talking about what makes sense from a planning standpoint. And if fairness means we're going to have more traffic at Stevenson and Spurwink, I don't get it. Uh, but that, that's where I come out. I, 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 from the very beginning, have been telling the applicant they've got to consider sidewalks in Mitchell Highlands. But, so I'm not doing this to say, well, now they get to spend less money. I'm concerned with what makes sense from a planning perspective. And now that we have this new ordinance, which I don't favor, but we've got it, I think it makes sense from a planning perspective to put it on Chicory Way. I, I don't see uh, how, f I mean, I, I'm not buying the fairness argument. Go ahead, Jack. I, I think there might be a misleading statement in here. I think you might be misinterpreting something. You talk about reduction by 37%. I believe that's 37% reduction compared to if it were a cut through. If you look at, uh, the second bullet under option B gate plan, reduction there is 70%. Okay? So if you divide the traffic between the two neighborhoods, you get a reduction of 70% on the Spurwink and Stevenson exit. Well, maybe we could have the traffic engineer clarify that point. I, I thought one of the reasons why the traffic would decrease under the Chicory gate proposal is that you would not have residents of the Mitchell Highlands coming through. See, well, they, they could they have were. if it were open. Tom Goral with Goral Palmer. Yeah, go ahead. It, absolutely, and, and you're sort of both right here. Um, if you look at the original proposal, um, or the proposal has been a lot of, the one that was granted preliminary approval, that didn't have a gate. There was concern relative to an assessment of how much cut through traffic would happen. Um, there were 43 trips that were associated with the development, and then there were trips associated with cut-through. We didn't feel that there was going to be a lot of cut-through. A lot of people disagreed, but the peer review number that was established added to the 43 and brought us up to a potential of 81 trip ends at Stevenson. With the gate, we reassigned the traffic for just the development, which then rises at Stevenson from 43 to 51. But the potential cut through obviously is eliminated. So you have the reduction from the potential of 81 if there had been that much cut through. So I think that's what John was talking about. Could I paraphrase, try to paraphrase what you said? Sure. 37% um, refers to the reduction with no cut through traffic. Compared, 37% compared to the reduction achieved 
versus the case where cut through traffic were allowed. Correct. Yeah, I would say that's. Now, there's a further reduction fair. if we go to gate B, the option B for the gate, a further reduction on the traffic going to Spurwink and Stevenson. Isn't that correct? There, I didn't quite get that last part. If we, if we go to option B for the gate, for the placement of the gate, there is a further reduction on yes. the traffic at Spurwink and Stevenson. Correct. Okay. And we do send a portion of it corresponding to the reduction. Right out to right. Columbus. Right. So we still maintain a uh, block for cut through traffic and we divide the traffic in some roughly equal way between the two yep. egress points. Yep. I think the only point was that what the way the preliminary approval was granted, there was up to 81 trips at Stevenson. So this is obviously a reduction by putting in the gate right. is where the statement that was made. Is part of the cut through traffic traffic that would have originated from the Mitchell Highlands yes. subdivision? Yes. Okay. All right. And I, I, I suppose maybe it's all semantics, but I never really considered somebody leaving the Mitchell Highlands subdivision as part of the, the, the fear that everyone had of this becoming a major artery. It seemed like the, the abutting neighborhoods driving through this was sort of assumed. I, I always assumed that that would happen, but I didn't assume that somebody who lives outside of the neighborhoods would be cutting through. Anyway. So I, it, does anybody have one, any more? One final yeah, thing. go ahead, Jack. So there is no net reduction for option B versus option B. In fact, option B is a reduction on Spurwick and Stevenson compared to option A. Right, I think it depends what you're comparing. Exactly. Option A compared to the original plan right. is a reduction, right. but you're absolutely right. right. Compared to option B under the, the the gate ordinance, it would be a reduction. Right. Another way to say it is that the plan is currently proposed represents a reduction at Stevenson from the plan that was approved. Which permitted cut through traffic. Correct. Which had up to 80. But now we have totally an ordinance that doesn't permit cut through traffic. So Understood. That, that's a moot point. That's okay. a point I'm trying to make. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, it sounds like we're going to have more, a little bit more on our plate then if, uh, tonight. I'm seeing perhaps just David and me uh, as the ones in favor of Chicory Way, and the remaining are in favor of Option B, which means that we're going to have to, which is fine. We're going to have to consider a number of other issues, but that helps frame our discussion for the evening. My only concern is how firm is everybody on this, because we could spend a lot of time. <laughs> going through this and if, if there's, I mean, is there any, any other question that people feel they need to have answered or are well, folks feeling pretty set? I guess I do, is how difficult is it at a later date to then, if, if there is a cut through, through Maxwell to move everything over to Chicory so you have a loop? Would that be, is that, your, was that what you were thinking, Paul? Peter. That at some point, at later in the future, that it happened, that that, that it makes sense to have, because I think ultimately it would make sense to have a, but then how difficult is that? Do you need other kinds of easements around Chicory Way? Do you, you need would, this hammerhead? You would clearly need to reserve that as part of this approval. The <coughs> mechanism to bring it back in front of us, I'm not so sure. Yeah, well, <laughs> it, it, <laughs> if, if, if the Maxwell property owners were to come along and say, we want to develop this, and because they can't have a dead end road, they would have to connect to South Street, then by default, the next planning board would have to remove that gate and place it on Chicory Way, or am I, is that wrong? How would, it's an interesting. Uh, yep. Yeah. The, the, the question is that people who live right next to these gates love the gates going to be extremely difficult to get rid of the gate. So it's going to be, I think there's going to be a huge likelihood that if you ever try to connect up to South Street and you have to find a way to um, comply with this new gate, I like your term, gate ordinance, um, they could easily just put a gate just south of the condominiums. What, I think what the town... what I'm saying? No, it's just no... There's no nothing add etched gate. in stone. Oh, add, add, another two gates. add another gate. Yeah. Why yeah. not? <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, folks, that, that points yeah. to the problem with it in the 
We, we, uh, I think that we're going to have the town planner get an aerial view so we can better understand this. Sure. But that, that is a, that is a likely. I like, I like the gate at Chicory Way. If someone tells me that to try to get to there five years from now or ten years from now, it's impossible. You know, it would be impossible to do that. Then I would put it in now. That's, that's what I'm saying. That's and what then, I'm and saying. Then, and then where do the sidewalks go out, Columbus? You're saying just forget about it at this point. <laughs> Well, if it gets to Chicory Way, why bother? Yeah, why? I'm, no, that's what I'm asking. No, today I think they should go in. I think that the I think the gate should be at South on South Street. I think we should do that work, mm. and then what, at some later date when no, but other let, property gets developed and Chicory Way goes in, there's already sidewalks in Columbus and other places. Let's assume the opposite, though, John. That it, it, it's, you know you're inclined to put it at Chicory. Are you saying then forget about the sidewalk work on Columbus? Yes. That's what I'm choking on, I guess. Well, Peter, the only reason to install sidewalks on Columbus Road is if we are allowing tra more traffic to go through there. So if we're not having an impact, unless the neighborhood says we want to have sidewalks, <laughs> no, even if there's no really that's not that doesn't make any sense. The, the concern I have, which the town planner alluded to, is, and we can't predict what's going to happen, but let's just say the Maxwell property gets developed. I can bet you there's a 90 to, 90 to 99 percent chance that all of the residents of the condominium area are going to want to have a gate in front of their, in front of their uh, basically on the edge of that property. So now we will have uh, essentially two gates. Uh, it just, again, I, I don't think that makes any sense from a planning standpoint. I, 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 I'd like to just interject one thing. I, I mean, I just, from a planning point of view, I think duplicate gates or multiple gates is just a wrong idea, bad idea. Um, we, you know, the applicant would be willing to put, yeah, the applicant would be willing to, if the board, I know, I just want to explain something. If the board decides the gate should be on South Street, we'd be willing to put the him ahead in this location, or at least reserve that area, to allow for the relocation of the gate. Um, you know, I, I just got to say that I think that um, the, the, of, of all the bullets that I listed as advantages for placing the gate on Chicory, I, to me, the most important one is that we aren't creating a separation within Spearwick Woods. I mean, I think it's just really bad planning, really bad design, to separate this development. And again, well, if... Why? Why? Yeah. It's, to me, it's a snobbish well, feature. I mean, if you're, if you're living here and you want to visit a friend in here, or you have to travel three and a half miles to get there. John, that, that just tells me the gate shouldn't be in the first place. But the, the point is, but why, from a planning perspective, is that any more magical than putting it somewhere else. I mean, it's interior to development, there's houses and there's condos. So to me, I just don't see that why that makes a difference. Well, to, to me it does. I, I just don't think it's a good idea to separate this development. Um, so anyways. Um, John, because we're focusing on the Maxwell property, we see where the, that South Street, that is essentially the Loop Road, that if, if that property were to be developed, I'm assuming that that road would continue through what looks like some cleared area and curve around if, to Spurwink Avenue? The, I think the natural alignment for this connection would be in this location here. There's, a, there's an existing farm road mm -hmm. that travels in this direction here, and more than likely this alignment would follow that farm road. Um, there's good sight distance in either direction from this point here, and uh, uh, so I think that road would travel in this. And if the uh, Dermot Drive and Hamlin, can you just sort of trace where the existing sidewalks already are when you exit Spurwink Woods? Yep, the existing sidewalk travels along uh, Dermont 
and along Hamlin on this side here. Um, travels, I, I believe it goes all the way down to Stevenson. Yes. Down to Stevenson. I'm sorry, okay. right here. Right here. <coughs> uh, and, and are the homes on that area, except as you get closer to Spurwink, I think they've been there for a while, but are those new homes that uh, abut that sidewalk for the most part? Yes, they are. Yes, and I believe there's one lot that isn't built on yet. Uh, but these roads, uh, I mean, these roads are built to town standards, mm -hmm. 22 feet wide, curbing sidewalk. Mm -hmm. And uh, m my concern is that we will likely see a second gate go in there and make <coughs> We don't care about that, but I do. It just doesn't make any sense to me to have uh, <clears throat> a bunch of dead ends that would prevent what would be a, 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 a loop road that makes sense from a planning perspective. Jack. Um, it's not clear to me that there would need to be a gate put in if Maxwell Land gets developed. Um, Maxwell Land gets developed, isn't that on Spurwink Road too? I'm not sure there's any real cut through potential. That would cut through to uh, Columbus Road. That would, that would be the same problem. No, but if, if the gate goes up here then at that point. No, I'm saying, okay, I'm, I guess I'm referring to the case we put the gate in option B now and move it, move it to option A uh, if the maximum one gets developed. And there's no need for an additional gate at that point. It still remains one gate. The question is, can, can we, in approving this plan, require the removal of that gate and the replacement of it on Chicory Way? I think that's a good question, Mr. Chair, because I, I, you've, 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 you've almost presented us with a third option here. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> well, I mean, get, you know, gate at location A, gate at location B, but the third option is, is there a potential for two gates? And you're right. I mean, at what point does this just become ridiculous? And we've so thrown planning out the window because of the vote that was recently passed that we're being forced to try to predict what the future is going to hold. But, you know, I... I I, I absolutely hear what you're saying. I mean, if, if I have a choice between one gate or two gates, you know, that has to be put, that has to be thrown into the mix. And that's where this is becoming. Well, that's, my, my point is that doesn't have to be the choice. Would it, would it be helpful for the members of the planning board if we were to convene with our town attorney to talk about that particular issue? <coughs> Whether in a plan we could require the gate to be moved should the Maxwell property be developed? I believe so. I see you nodding head. So, actually, I, as chair, this is the first time I've had to do this. I believe we would need a motion then to convene in an executive session uh, or confidential session with our town attorney. Excuse me. If if you want to receive confidential legal advice, you can retire into executive session. But if you're looking merely for a range of options and legal opinions, you, you don't have to retire okay. to executive session. Fair enough. Yep, that's I would, fine. I'd like to have public because I'm Yeah, and I, I would like to avoid you. an executive session unless, yep. we, unless the town attorney thinks that's what no. we should be. No, I don't, I don't think it's not necessary fine. at this point. I don't think so either. Okay. Uh, okay. Then did you, the question we're grappling with, is, that, is our question clear enough to you for you to give us an answer or some guidance? <laughs> I, I, ideally, the right answer. answer the question and then we'll tell you. Say no, we'll try again. Uh, well, I can state this. My name is Michael Hill, Thank and you. I'm here on behalf of the town. That much I know. Now, uh, I think that it's a, um, it would be difficult to put the uh, gate one place with a condition that if X, Y, or Z happens that it has to be moved to another location. I just, I just see that as uh, a, a difficult condition to put on the, on the plan. Uh, legally, you could, prob you, you could probably s state that. I just don't know that, that, that it's necessarily binding on the next planning board that comes and takes a look at it. Okay, because, uh, anyhow. Um, I think that if the uh, proposal meets the standards that you, you know you would need to uh, approve that that proposal and I'm, I'm I think either proposal option A or option B meets the standards with respect to the 
uh, dead end road standards and the, and the new uh, gate ordinance, so or shortcut ordinance, whatever you want to call it. I don't know if that's helpful. <laughs> no, that is helpful. Does anybody else have questions uh, for Mike Hill on this issue? Paul? I do, and, and, and I apologize for pressing, but could you give me an example as to why is this difficult in your opinion? I, I, I'm just curious, why, why would well, you consider this difficult? I would, I would think it'd be difficult, uh, just as it's difficult for you today to talk about the uh, traffic impact on, on the uh, existing neighborhood, that it would be difficult uh, 10 years from now if the Maxwell property is developed and the owners, whoever is there uh, along South Street, if the gate's there, mm -hmm. they're going to say, look, we bought this property with these sets of rights. We are totally against the uh, removal of that gate. That was an attractive thing about the uh, property. You're going to get a real uh, outcry, I think, from the people that it's going to adversely affect at that time. So I'm saying you can, I think you could legally make that a condition. I just think it sets up the next planning board for a difficult time. Uh, and I don't know that it would be binding on the next planning board. I just don't see it as being binding on them. I mean, you could, you could state that that's your, uh, intention in approving it today, but it, it, it doesn't bind the next planning board. You know, and I'm not sure we'd want to. I mean, I just, you, just, yeah, you we, don't know what the, the you don't know what's going to happen. So, are. Yeah. I don't know, but, but I, but I, I yeah, yeah, <laughs> and we're going to move the gate. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, yeah. not a good idea. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot. Any, Barbara. I have a question that you don't have to answer, but was, was there any way to get Maxwell to agree to let you use that existing road and make a loop going around the other way and then you wouldn't even need Chicory Way? Or is that an unfair question to ask? Go ahead, Maureen. actually, we, Maureen has some intelligence on this. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I have had some conversations with the Maxwell family, and they are only at the very earliest stages of thinking about what they may or may not want to do. And I would hate for the planning board to be perceived as encouraging a farming family to want to develop their property. Thank you. Well said. David. Well, <clears throat> I'd like to revisit the sidewalk a second. I think my reason for, as I stated, was that during the site walk, I did not get the feeling that all the people in Columbus were in favor of a sidewalk, regardless. And I am probably very one of the few people on the original planning board when I started that wanted sidewalks. So, and I, I still believe in them, but I don't think that, I don't think it, it's a situation where you can get a consensus easily on Columbus, and that's a tough job. Um, we'll just open up another can of worms, which I'm not sure we're ready to do, but that's why I believe that the easiest way for everybody here is to put the gate at Chicory and uh, make it a little more comfortable for the people on Columbus. All right, I think we've probably aired all of the pros and cons of the location. Uh, I believe it would make sense to take a, a, a straw vote because we're going to be delving into a lot of other issues tonight, but on the location of the gate because that has an impact on other things. Uh, who among the board is in, uh, would, would vote in favor of the gate being located on South Street? That, that's option B. I see three. Option A. <laughs> Is there none of the above? <laughs> on, uh, yeah, well, we can't do that on Chicory Way. Well, we may have. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. I'm undecided at this point. Okay. Sorry. <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> I 
You know what, I wanted to make sure we had an odd number of planning board members to avoid this scenario. <laughs> Here we are, that's okay. Um, uh, why don't we take a break from the location of the gate and I will ask the board members and, and let's not get into traffic calming measures either, but to, because we've already, we're already up to eight o'clock, there are additional questions that I had as a result of the last public hearing uh, there may be questions that other board members had as a result of the public hearing or the submission uh, materials that have come in. Uh, so if anybody wants to raise those questions now, why don't we get into that? I guess I would ask the board to steer clear of sidewalks, et cetera. Uh, but Paul, if that's going to help you decide the issue, then by all means ask. Okay. Are there questions? that board members have on other issues? <coughs> okay. Could I, could go I ahead. ask? Go ahead, Jack. I was actually would like to ask a question of a board member, just for, for discussion. Uh, John, you, you changed your mind about A versus B. I'd be interested in why. Because it seemed like after the town attorney got up that it, it was it was just going to be too difficult later on to mm -hmm. make changes and I'm not, I'm against more gates yeah I am too I mean we're already obliged to have one right so no, I simply yeah Barbara you would raise your hand did you well I just wondered if you've gone have you heard back from EPA about the the stormwater runoff and gotten your your um, uh, I have talked to them, and uh, everything has been finally approved, uh, reviewed, and approved. We're just waiting for the board order. From so the they're EPA. they're happy with the stormwater plan and using the uh, the sheet flow. Coming yes. From, okay. Yes. I'm just going to refer to some of my notes from the last hearing, uh, Mr. Keck. Uh, one of his uh, issues that he raised was that the, that the trail system was impractical due to the location of the level lip spreaders. I'm wondering if you have anybody here tonight that might address that issue. I don't, it's not a concern that I necessarily have, but it was posed by a member of the public. Uh, yeah. This one spur. What's that? I thought that we spur. I thought that we answered that or addressed that at the last meeting. Okay, um, I apologize if you did. Mr. Hatem, and the spur was put in as a means of access for public works to go in there and do maintenance. So, okay. And instead of letting them put in the road, they agreed they could live with something that looked just like the trail we were already putting you know, in. I, well, I think it was, it was the sheet pole. But the, you know the trail is cut across the lip spreaders. It may appear that way in the plan, but it. Is that right that none of the proposed trails cut across the level lip spreader? Excuse me? Do, do any of the proposed trails cut across the level lip spreader? No. Okay. No. All right. There was also another question about the um, removal of the crosswalk by the public's work director. Has that been removed from the plan? That was, someone had asked that question. And I think it was Paul brought it up. That's, that's and is still it on now the, out of the plan? It's still on the current plan set we have. Yeah, in the, raised cross. the removal of the raised crosswalk. Yeah, that the town has the option of removing it. We wanted it off. Yeah. That note on the plan, we had asked that, that be okay. taken off. Okay. Um, we'll take that off. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Mr. Chair, question. Yes. Question for that, John. Um, could you verbalize the proposed? improvements to the Spurwink Stevenson Avenue intersection <coughs> under option A versus option B for me please. I'm going to let Tom do that. Thank you. That'd okay. Great. <coughs> Tom Goral, Goral Palmer again. Really it's under option A or B. I would say they're the same um, at the intersection with Stevenson and Spurwink which I think was your question, correct? That's, that is correct, Tom. Yeah. We had recommended um, that there be improvements, um, primarily made it, making it into a three-way stop. 
Uh, we considered trimming vegetation. A little of that might be appropriate, but there, you know, if you get into much and certainly what would be required to come close to the sight lines uh, would have a significant impact on adjacent properties, which I think the board was concerned with as well. So we came up with a three-way stop option and to put in a um, advanced um, actuated flashing warning light, which means it only flashes when traffic is approaching on approaching the intersection um, from uh, Stevenson. So it's you know it's all, it's not going to flash all the time essentially, um, and we might actually have it on some other approaches as well. But that was the idea. Um, now I know that there was talk about well maybe we could make it a two-way stop and we could perhaps monitor it and see if we really needed the flashing warning uh, lights. I know your peer review through uh, Mr. Erica Wilbur Smith indicated, um, I think that there, uh, he was on board with the, with the flashing light issue. We're okay, I think, with um, monitoring it. I do think you'd have to have at least a two-way stop, but I, um, you know, and then monitor it to see what it, what it actually looks at. I could be okay with that, but I think we'd have to have a monitoring program in place. Okay. So, so we're willing to work, as I said, with the board on that issue. Okay. But to summarize, Tom, just so I, I make sure I'm clear and hopefully other board members are clear, the proposal in the, in the, in the, for the improvements at that intersection that received preliminary approval are the same improvements that you're recommending now, which is a three-way stop and some limited trimming uh, and also a, a advanced flashing warning when vehicles are approaching the intersection. Correct. Okay. And that would be the same under either option A or B. Okay. Tom, in your professional opinion, can the Spurwink Stevenson Ave uh, uh, Spurwink Avenue Stevenson Street intersection safely and adequately handle traffic under both option A and B? With those recommendations, yes. Thank you. I think it might be useful to stay with this intersection because either way, it, it, we have to deal with the Stevenson Spurwink intersection. So, if anybody has other questions about that, feel free to raise them now, Barbara. Well, I wish we knew how the abutters felt. I know one abutters here with, about the. I'd be crazy if I had a flashing light going off 51 times in one hour and then 510 times during the day. I, it would bother me, but I don't know about anybody else. Um, so I don't know how many abutters. I know Mr. Bryant did write a letter about the intersection, which might be appropriate to refer to since he's going to be directly affected. Um, to find that letter, though. Somebody else remembers, please. No, I think, and if I recall from the site walk uh, and maybe an earlier hearing, the concern was the light going off too often and that would that bother the abutters. Uh, I think during the day, I can't imagine that's an issue. Correct. Uh, it's really more at night. Correct. And did we or talk, or maybe I'm making this up, did we ever have a discussion about whether after a certain hour, 11 o'clock or midnight, that it would be deactivated? Or, or, and would you ever recommend that? I'm not, no, I probably wouldn't because the issue is still potentially there. But there are uh, certain issues that take care of some of the concerns I think that the neighbors have in terms of today's technology. Obviously, there's shielding. There's also LED technology so that the, the actual you know, irritation uh, to the neighbors is far less I think than it would have been, and how you actually the light is focused. Exactly, at. it's focused at the travel way. It's very similar to traffic signals. Essentially, if you get a little far afield, um, it, they're more difficult to see. So I guess I would. I think we could look into <coughs> trying to focus that just as much as possible to minimize, because that is absolutely a legitimate concern. I would agree, and I think that was what our we indicated earlier was a willingness to to work um, with. The board and, and also your uh, the abutter to try to minimize those effects. What? I, how? how can I, uh, Go ahead. How does it? When you say minor trimming, I mean, how do we? How does that get defined? I mean, so that. Well, how is it really done in real life? Once you're out there and you're saying I'm going to do this minor trimming, and someone else doesn't feel like that's really minor. Well, that's that's the first thing I'd probably do is meet with people to see what. Because usually there's some um, 
most of our experience anyway with the neighbors is that you know they can be pretty reasonable when it comes to what is important to them and what isn't and I, I'm not suggesting that there's going to be wholesale trimming out there that's going to solve the problem but there are I think some uh, brush and that kind of thing that probably isn't as important to them um, but again I think that's a field walk with the neighbors certainly but does it require I mean so th this obviously is something that has to be done periodically I mean it, as this grows I think it, it has to get grown. knocked back and the it has time, grown over the years there, you know making sure that everything is smooth and everything yep. is working properly but the next time you might not be there and the time after that and yeah I think that it's just the town is yeah that that is that's true that's a that's a maintenance issue and I suspect that it wasn't probably quite as bad at one point as it is today and that's because probably of things growing out further as time goes on um, that has somewhat crept into the line of sight uh, today over what it might have been in the past. What do the plans state now regarding uh, the landscaping around that intersection, whether adding to or taking away? Right now, I believe, and I'd have to actually, do you have? Just in your yeah, okay. Right now, we had just to talk, just talked about the three-way stop and the flashing lights. Okay. Any more questions on that issue? Mm -hmm. Oh, Barbara. May I just read what Mr. Bryant said? Sure. Just so we have an abutter's opinion. I don't know whether there are any others or not, but I don't remember reading any others. Barbara, what, what's the date of that uh, letter? The date of the letter is June 20th, and it came in today. Okay. Um, at the former, the ideas were to retain existing buffering, i.e. my hedges, to, if, if stop signs prove necessary, go with a two-way stop rather than a three-way stop, and consider a buffering for the yard on the east side of Spurwink where the stop sign would be and explore whether some activated warning was feasible for when our blind driveway was in use or if a mirror opposite the driveway would be of any help. So. No, I, I, how, how would a two-way stop sign work as a traffic engineer or, Paul, I'll ask you too, how would it, as opposed to a three-way stop sign? And before we get into that, is that the, where the, the two stop signs would be at where the, neighbor, the new neighbor, well, Stevenson ends onto Spurwink, that's where one stop sign is, as yep. you're coming out of Spurwink Woods. Yep. Where's the other one? Well, I think the, the concept um, was to, um, you also have a, I'm not sure I have a plan out that far. Yeah, uh, behind you. Uh, no. yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. Could, could you just, Tom, could you just remove this so we can all see? It's yeah. right in our we line can of do sight. That. Thank you. Um, the real issue as we come out on, on Stevenson, you've got, uh, an issue, obviously, someone that wants to turn left and come out has to see around that direction. But we also have an issue of this left turn in. They need to be able to see. So I think the concept was essentially to stop those folks and potentially to stop people that were coming from this way was the way I would understood it because you do have this left turn that's, you know, an issue. I can't see around that corner if I'm making a left turn into the, into the site. So there's, there's really two uh, line of sights you worry about, traffic exiting and also traffic turning left from Spurwink onto Stevenson. So that's what we were just looking at, uh, stopping all three. How much traffic turns left from in the direction you're talking about on Spurwink into Stevenson? Because most people will be coming from this 77, won't they? It's from Spurway. Yeah. Fair amount, actually. I mean, the percentage wise, um, let's see. About, uh, well, more are turning left onto Stevenson than right onto Stevenson. Really? Yes. Yeah. Today. I mean, today, obviously, it's an existing. It's an existing issue, as we all know, up there today. I think your issue is we're adding some traffic to it, but we, it's clearly an existing condition that's there today. Well, 
and I guess just to help close the loop on this, I, my, I believe part of my inkling towards trying to divide uh, the development up into two pieces, so to speak, share the traffic burden. Um, I do have a safety concern with this intersection. Um, you know, the, the, the three-way stop, while I think it addresses, addresses it appropriately, also has the potential to be an issue because you generally don't expect stop signs on through roadways. So even though there is a solution at hand, it may also create a problem uh, unintentionally. Uh, I, I am of the opinion that this location will, will require some, some monitoring, uh, will probably require some coordination with the neighbors. Um, I, I would think I would like to get, ultimately once we get a decision on what we, the board, think is appropriate, get, a, get an opinion from our town's traffic engineer on that. But I guess I'm sensitive to the fact that by adding more traffic to this intersection, there is a potential for this intersection to worsen. To what degree, I don't know. But I think we need to be responsive in that regard. Um, but again, I also I want to try to do this, you know, uh, uh, appropriately with 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 neighborhood input. So um, again, it, depending on what our decision is, I'd, I'd I'd like to get some professional input from the from the town traffic engineer on in, in that regard to see if they. But we have that on a three-way. Do we have that on a three-way versus a two-way? Okay, and that's that's what I would like to. Because again, if I was living there and I had a flashing beacon, I would think that would be some level of concern. Is that necessary? Is that required? I have my own opinion, but I think for the board's um, state of mind, I think getting a professional opinion on <coughs> all the options on the table is probably a, a good idea. So based on that statement, uh, what I'm gleaning, Paul, is that you, you wouldn't even be prepared then to have a vote on final approval tonight uh, because you need more guidance on the Stevenson Spurwing intersection. It would need to be a condition that would need to be reviewed, and I don't think it needs to be a condition of approval, but it is something that would need to be followed up and monitored. That is my opinion, yes. So, it, I guess I still don't understand your answer. Okay, and I and I and I, and I apologize, Mr. Chair. Um, That's okay. The proposal at hand is a three-way stop with a flashing beacon. I understand there's been some concerns by the neighbors and others that perhaps uh, a flashing beacon might be too extreme. Um, I, sh I share that sentiment. A two-way stop has been proposed by some. Um, I think a two-way stop might be better, but I'd also think it would behoove us to get another opinion in that regard. Okay, just, uh, and I think you know this, but um, I was trying to find it, but Mr. Erico had provided an opinion at one point. On, on the two-way stop, Tom? On the, on the three-way oh, stop. I, I, I know what his opinion is on the three-way stop. Okay. I, I, have, I, I have no problem with that. Cool. Um, okay. I have some concern with a three-way stop again. Just, I mean, this is just, yep. this is how not to design an intersection. You know, you don't want to put a intersection on a sharp curve and add traffic to it. It has the potential, and I say potential because we don't know, to become a safety issue. Um, the proposed improvements that you've recommended, I am, I'm on board with, but I do want to be um, cognizant of the neighbor's concerns regarding the flashing beacon. Um, if we could get an opinion from the town's engineer on not having the flashing beacons or versus a two-way stop, I think that would help me in my ability to make a decision on that intersection and level of improvement. It, and I think we're flexible yeah. relative yep. to what option that is. I'm not saying that, that you know, we agree if, if yep. Mr. Errico thinks that um, the two-way would work. <clears throat> Yep. I think I hear you saying, and I would concur that it, you try that and you do monitor it, and yep. if necessary, you do look at the three-way stop if that if that's deemed appropriate. Yep. Um, so I don't think, um, from my perspective as, as representative for the applicant on the issue, that there that we would disagree. I think we have the flexibility on that. If Tom said two, then that's the way we go. Yeah, I, and, and I would agree. I would, I would expect mm -hmm. the applicant to have flexibility in that. Again, I would just want to get some level of understanding of what folks thought was an appropriate mm -hmm. level of improvement. One option would be, and maybe you've already 
just said this, but if we were to move forward with an approval of this project, uh, it could be a condition for a two-way stop sign, or two-way stop signs at that intersection, that that would have to be approved by or signed off by the uh, peer review engineer. Mm -hmm. Barbara. But if I'm hearing Paul correctly, maybe, now initially it's not going to make any difference, but maybe Monterey, they're going to be there for a couple years, two or three years out, to see if any additional traffic calming measures need to be placed at that intersection. Yep. I mean, the, the danger is, under either option A or B, that this becomes a location that's a safety concern. Well, it is. And, at, and whose responsibility is it at the point when it becomes a safety concern. And that's something that, again, I, I understand the applicant is, pro is probably most likely flexible in making sure that that is addressed appropriately at some point in time. So I guess as long as that is a condition of approval, that I am, that, that I am comfortable with that. But the, the more pressing question than Paul is, where are you on the location of the gate <laughs> in light of this discussion? Or are you still, I don't mean to put you on the spot. No, I, no Mr. Mr. Chair, ab ab absolutely. If. But, but I'll do it anyway. No, that's, that, that's fine. If the intersection of Spurwink and Stevenson can be mitigated to operate safely at some point in the future after it has been built, then it is my opinion that I'd be more inclined to put a gate on Chicory Way. Okay. The, the danger with that statement is, is if it's not, and it becomes a safety concern, then the best thing for that intersection is to have less traffic through it versus more. So I, you know, maybe that's, maybe that's an ultimate condition. I, and I apologize for being on both sides of the fence on this. Uh, I am simply looking at a bad intersection with, that already has some issues associated with it. Um, the applicant now has the burden of dealing with that because they will be adding more traffic through that intersection. Uh, so again, I am I'm comfortable that we can work through and reach a right solution. Um, you know, a very extreme case might be you have to revisit this in terms of the gate location. Gosh, I hope not. <laughs> so at this point then, if I'm counting correctly, there are now four members of the planning board in favor of the Chicory Way gate location, which would be option A as opposed to option B. Yep. So I think we need to move forward then to the other areas of discussion. Yep. Um, are there other questions that board members had for the applicant, uh, whether it's related to traffic calming or stormwater management or anything else? There's been a lot of discussion among abutters about whether this, is, this development is in keeping with the surrounding areas. And I, I come back to some of the information that is in the memorandum that we received from the town planner. It seems to me Spurwink Woods is surrounded by residential development. Uh, it seems to me this is in keeping with what, what is already there. Uh, I think it, there's plenty of evidence to suggest that this is the level of density of this development, I know Barbara disagrees with me, but so be it, uh, is also in keeping with what is uh, already there. Uh, I, I can only imagine that the folks who resided near the Mitchell Highland subdivision were raising similar concerns uh, all those years ago when that development was being proposed. Um, and I suppose it's just a fact of life. Um, but does anybody, before we get to the motion, because there are several parts to the motion, does anybody have any other questions for the applicant? Okay. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Could we just uh, um, take a moment to address the stormwater 
Yes, thank you. Yeah, that would be helpful. Good evening, Al Palmer from Goral Palmer. In speaking with the town planner today, there was a question relative to the, the manner in which the DEP is reviewing this application. And I just wanted to recap that. I think we addressed it two or three meetings ago, but again, just to, to recap it for everyone. And in looking at that, we need to keep in mind the differences between the town of Cape Elizabeth ordinances and the DEP requirements. They are two different standards and we, we need to meet both of those. In reviewing the Cape Elizabeth standards, you've got a very specific standards relative to stormwater quantity. Um, it talks about the two and 25 year storm and trying to, to the extent practicable, keep flows at or below existing levels, but to infiltrate, to filter, and to enhance the water quality. The reason this project is going forward at the DEP level under the, what they would call the old rules, is in November, I believe it was November 15th of 2005, the DEP was required to use new regulations on all new applications. The legislature, when they adjourned last spring, um, enacted changes to Chapter 500. Those came into effect on November 15th. The application that was filed with the DEP was filed in October of 2005. So the, the application, the original application was filed prior to the new rules coming into effect. That's obviously important because the time at which you apply determines how they review an application. Due to the changes in the, the regulations, the DEP made a determination that projects that had even had a, uh, a scoping meeting or a pre-application meeting before November 15th could submit after that date and still be processed under the old rules. So we have several projects that are still ongoing review at the DEP that were submitted after November 15th, but we had our pre-applications meeting with the department prior to November 15th. Spurwink Woods went even one, one extent further and we had submitted the application prior to the November 15th deadline. So the DEP is required to review it under the old standards. Bottom line, the old standards require under the DEP guidelines to only look at quantity, water quantity. What are the peak flows leaving the site? Under the new regulations, the DEP for this size project would not be looking at water quantity at all. We would only be looking at water quality. We would not have to give them calculations for the two-year storm or the 25-year storm that are required under the town ordinances. None of those calculations are required under the new regulations for a project of this size. What the new regulations would require is for the applicant to enact best management practices, BMPs, that promote infiltration, promote filtering, or use of a, a wet pond for water quality treatment. As I believe all the board recalls, the first application that came forward had ponds as part of it. But in consultation with the staff and the DEP, it was felt that the better alternative was to use the level lip spreaders and use the natural vegetation and the natural topography to attenuate the flows and enhance the water quality. I believe from the town standpoint, you're getting the boast of both the best worlds, best of both worlds, in that we're addressing both quantity and quality through the use of the buffers. And you're getting the attenuation so that in your ordinance, you can feel comfortable that we're meeting the chapter 19 requirements, that for the two and 25 year storm, we are keeping flows to the extent practicable below the two and 25 year levels, which has been confirmed by your town engineer. And we have treatment systems compatible with what the new regulations would require relative to the level lip spreaders in the filters. We would be designing it the exact same way under the new regulations by using these filter strips. So I think we're meeting both the local standards under Chapter 19, also the DEP standards, 
in protecting both quantity and quality. Yes, Barbara, go ahead. Uh, just so I understand, um, the, the filters that are in the level lip spreaders then will essentially act as some kind of a purifier to the water to some degree anyway, whereas in the pond there was nothing like that. The old ponding, the, where we had the detention basins, there was, there was no filtering at all in those, was there? The, the treatment in a pond is through sedimentation. By having the water retained in the pond over a 24-hour period, you're getting settling, additional settling in the pond of any sediment that may be in that stormwater runoff. As it comes off the lawns, as it comes off the pavement, it has sediment in that a lot of the pollutants bind to the sediment. Over time, as the water works its way through the pond, you would get some of that to settle and a reduction in that sediment load and a, a purifying of the water. The newer standard, which is what the DEP is using in the, the best management practices, is to use that natural vegetation below the level lip spreader. All the level lip spreader does is try to spread the flow out so that when it goes into that forested area, it's not going in as a concentrated point, but it's being spread out over a 25-foot area. It then uses the natural topography to attenuate it. And when you're walking through the woods, you see the natural depressions, the rolling and pit and mound topography. The water goes in, it stores up in those areas, it gives it a chance to slow down and reduce that peak, but it also allows that forest duff layer to give it some treatment from a filtering standpoint and also binding some of that to the vegetation. So it's two different methods, but basically getting to the same approach. The problem with ponds, we have to cut down more trees to build a pond where the level lip spreaders we don't. So we reduce how much we have to clear. I just had a question about the, with, the, with the new regulations. And I understand they don't apply to this project, but with fertilizers and all the things that we would expect to be used in some of these residential homes, is all that now addressed in this quality issue? Salt from the roads when they're in the winter time and the the DEP standards don't regulate how much fertilizer people can use on the lawns. It doesn't regulate what salting levels are allowable on the road. Again, because they figure that that is something that is very variable, very hard to enforce um, relative to what levels of, of fertilizer are going to be used. They, they look more at the maintenance and operation of those buffers, protecting those buffers so that they can function and continue to pr provide that water quality. Well, but, yeah, but when you say water quality, you're talking about sediment then. Sediment, but also filtering because of going through the forest duff having those pollutants being able to be taken up by some biological activity because of the, the plants that are in that understory. Are there any other questions for Mr. Palmer? All right, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chair? Yes, go ahead. One question for John, if I can, please. Um, John, with option A or B, would there be a change in the proposed phasing of this project? Let's see. I've got, I've got the phasing. Yeah, currently, as stated on the plans, construction shall start with phase one. Phases two and three shall not be limited to a construction sequence. The reason I'm asking is the condominium units are shown in phase three. I was just curious if this change might trigger a, a difference of opinion in the phasing of the project. I don't think that it would, no. Um, we're proposing this area to be phase one, the single family lots um, down to this point here, including the infrastructure of the uh, uh, stormwater. Um, and then phase two would be the condominiums, and phase three would be Franklin Circle, so it would not change. Okay. Thank you, John. Just to, just to clarify, I believe it's the applicant's intent to build phase one first, 
and then just because they're numbered phase two and phase three, you actually might build phase three first or phase two first. That's correct. That yeah, and we've got a note on the plan to that effect. Yes. Yeah, I just want to make sure we weren't changing. Uh, Barbara. Can we just go over this gate a little bit? I mean, we have a little schematic here, but it might be helpful to hear a little bit more about it. Thank you, Barbara, for raising that issue. Uh, it was on my list. There, there's been some discussion uh, among some commentators as to whether there ought to be a, uh, an electronic system on the gate uh, versus, uh, versus what you've proposed, and I'm wondering if you could shed some light on that. Um, as I said, I consulted with Bob Malley on this. Um, he, um, he said to take a look at the Crescent Beach uh, gate and he wanted something similar in character in design to that. Um, I did take a look at that. Um, he also talked about the, the padlock, which we're showing here, um, which is uh, acceptable to him. Um, we did not talk about an electronic. I don't know, if Maureen, if you had any discussions on that. Did you? Um, I did ask town staff about uh, what they would like for a gate and after they stopped saying they didn't want a gate. Um, they made it very clear that they would prefer not to have any kind of electronic keypad gate. Uh, their specific reason is it is a huge maintenance headache. Uh, apparently Public Works has, um, I won't say where, but they have an electronic gate now that apparently people can push up uh, if they don't have the keypad and it will go up anyway, which is why people do it. So it, it's not working very well. Um, they have concerns with maintenance. They just want a plain old padlock that's easy to maintain, um, don't have to worry about other stuff. They, they want it. Their, pref their preference, unless the planning board wants something different, is to keep this simple. But it's made out of steel. Am I reading all this correctly? No, no, no. This is a timber. This is a timber. Well, timber. It's a steel a wood, here too. Well, no, there, there are steel brackets. Oh, okay. But okay. you know, these are. These, this is a extremely sturdy gate. It's eight by eight, two eight by eight posts, with a two by six plank in between, six by six uh, cross arms, um, braces, um, and that that steel that that you see is a thirty inch by fifteen inch, three eighths inch thick steel plate to support um, the timbers. Um, and another question that I have is, is it possible to, um, is that, since it's an access road now, it isn't really a way in and a way out, it's just emergency access, is it possible to keep that part of a dirt or just part of it look like a driveway? rather than a road that's 20, or does it have to be wide enough? I guess it has to be wide enough for emergency vehicles. I'm asking you more. The, the, the only, every so often, at least in neighborhoods that have these gates, you have to open it up to allow for traffic to get it in, in and out in case there's a blockage somewhere else within the neighborhood. So I, I guess I would be reluctant. To have it would have to be just part of the road. Then. But maybe the ordinance actually speaks to that. Emergency access lane is defined in the subdivision ordinance as a public or private paved road with a minimum width of 18 feet, which is not open to through, tra through vehicular traffic. This type of road may provide secondary emergency access to an area served by a dead end road. Do you have any follow up on that? Are there any other questions? Just procedurally, when we have to review uh, this uh, for final approval, we do need to vote separately on each finding of fact, correct? Okay, and that's, if you recall, when we did Blueberry Ridge, we went through each finding of fact individually, and then we have to vote yay or nay on that particular finding of fact. <coughs> so as we go along, there would be an opportunity for further discussion with respect to the possibly 49 findings of fact. So 
we will have more opportunity for discussion. Uh, it may make sense for us to take turns reading these. Uh, uh, Paul. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. Um, I know when we go through and mention all of these, uh, and one of the things that I'd like to bring forward as, as part of this process would be a condition of approval. And I didn't know if that should be brought out now so that the applicant could respond to this prior to us going through all of, all of those steps and motions. Is, is that appropriate? That's fine. And I think certainly uh, one of the conditions of approval would be the location of the gate on Chicory Way. But did you want to speak to the Stevenson Spurwick intersection? I do, Mr. Chair. Okay. Um, what I'd like to propose that we add to the conditions of the approval is that we change it to say that the traffic improvements for the Spurwink Stevenson intersection be reduced to a two-way stop, the first stop being on Stevenson Street exiting on the uh, Spurwink, and then on the uh, southbound Spurwink Avenue approach uh, without a flashing beacon if the town traffic engineer agrees that this will meet safety needs. The applicant and the town traffic engineer will also agree on a level of monitoring at this intersection to ensure that if safety becomes an issue at this intersection, that the applicant propose to the town and pay for additional or alternate mitigation measures at the intersection, um, period. These mitigation measures may include additional stop signs, flashing beacons, or relocation of the emergency gate. That is what I am suggesting be considered by the board, and I would also see if the applicant would want to respond to that. So I, basically what I'm saying, folks, is if this location becomes a safety concern, if we have a, heaven forbid, a, fa a fatality, or it becomes, you know, it becomes a high crash location as defined by the DOT, that I think there would need to be additional mitigation measures addressed. Um, it could be just some additional stop signs, could be a flashing beacon, it could be the full gamut of relocating the emergency gate, such as to reduce traffic at that intersection. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about safety and the additional amount of traffic, and I want to make sure that the applicant is responsible for dealing with that uh, at a point. Um, actually, I, I did not mention that. Let me mention that, that they would need to monitor this probably at a period of 12 months after the completion of phase one. So I hope, hope that was clear to the board. If not, I'm happy to try to clarify. So, so you put back the signs to the stop signs to two. Yes. From what they have that what they have proposed. Yeah. And I guess I'm always in favor of. Yeah. I mean, especially in this place, of three. I mean, if that's what they're recommending, okay. I, I think I would. And I can. So, so then, the, but the only, but the only option I would have is to say that I, to vote no, if, if we can't, because <laughs> I kind of yep. agree with all the other, th okay. uh, some of the other things about monitoring. Yep. And I'm. I can go back and forth two with two, between two and three way. I, I don't think that, that that's not my that's not my sticking point at this point. My sticking point is monitoring and, and the and the and the potential for a um, a safety issue at this location. And if there does become one, I would like the applicant to be responsible for dealing with that and paying for that. And and for what it's worth, I would agree with that condition of approval, but I'm inclined to agree with John on the three stop signs. Okay. I would like to see us try to get this is that right out of the gates. I'm willing to go three if the board is inclined to go in that direction. Uh, and I, I do recall three, three without a flash and beacon warning sign. With all the continued monitoring that you've yeah. suggested. Yep. Mr. Goral? Yeah, I think that was, you know, his motion was, was well thought out. I mean, we can do the three as well. We're, we're flexible. I did have one question, Sure. which was the direction of your or placement of your stop signs was, if as I understood it, this, if you're going to three, but if this is, if you were doing two. It would have been northbound. My apologies. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Just wanted to be sure. Thank you for being in the wrong direction. You just wait a minute. Jeff? Um, my concerns are the same ones that, that Paul's voicing about potential danger at this intersection. Are there any standards for what defines a dangerous intersection short of fatalities? Yes. Yeah. Tom, exactly. go ahead. Yeah, you can do it as well. It, basically, what we're looking at is the potential is any time you have sight line restrictions, 
um, it reduces you know, the safety of potential safety of the intersection. Some of the ones that you'd think are the worst actually have a, a great safety record. Yep. Um, and that's due in part probably to, I guess you call it traffic calming or something, where people know it's so bad <laughs> yep. that they take it easy going through and it just doesn't show up as a problem. I wasn't there so much in terms of sight lines as I was in terms of traffic volume and traffic character. Yeah, um, this, in terms of the, the traffic volume, and I, I know these, any volume sound like a lot in the neighborhood, but from a capacity and a, a volume sort of standpoint, it's a relatively, even with this project, it's, it's a relatively low volume of traffic that we're dealing with. Um, but there's no question this is going to add, as Paul said, significantly more traffic. But even with that, it's a relatively low amount of traffic. So the hazard that's created, um, and, and everybody knows it's obviously not traffic that's not familiar with the area. Um, they do know that that exists. So yes, there is the potential. It's measured basically in, by sight lines. There's also accident history. There isn't really any here. Um, so uh, that's how we've determined it, was looking at, at the sight lines. And I think probably vegetation's grown in some over the years as well, which. <clears throat> Okay. We also asked the applicant to uh, perhaps put it in there to work with the, the abutter to install the mirror. I realize that's not a very big deal, but while you're out there working, it might be easy. Okay, so at the request of the abutter, you would be willing to put in a mirror as the... We certainly can work with... Uh, yep. Okay. Yep. My suggestion as we go through these findings, in fact, is maybe just go down the line. <laughs> uh, since I'm chair, I don't have to do it. But uh, if, if Peter could start with number one under findings of fact, and we could, if there's a need for discussion, we can discuss it and then take a vote and then move on to number two. It's a very fair approach. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, is that way it's set to start, folks? Okay. Getting your water. Go ahead. Um, motion for the board to consider first finding a fact that the pro proposed project is a cluster <laughs> residential development with permanently preserved open space and these uses do not generally include discharges to the water or air that are reg regulated as pollution the pl plan will not result in undue water or air pollution the project does not include floodplain areas the project will be served by public sewer instead of subsurface disposal systems the plan includes construction of level lip spreaders that discharge stormwater over a 100-foot wide naturally vegetated area intended to absorb and cleanse stormwater flows before they are discharged into an existing RP1 designated wetland. The slope of the land and the creation of a 100-foot wide natural vegetation buffer will mitigate the impact of stormwater flows. A motion has been made by Peter. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by David. Is there any further discussion on findings of fact number one? All those in favor of finding a fact number one? Oh, did you, want to, you wanted to discuss? No, I, I just want to say something just so that everybody's clear. Some of these are sort of no-brainers, and I'm going to vote in favor of them. There are going to be others I'm not going to vote in favor of, so just to be clear to the board, that, and to the people here, so they know that. But that's why we're taking the money. I mean, there, there are some things that just seem fairly obvious. Anyway, okay. So I'm feel, voting. Okay, and, and I mean, that's essentially, you feel the record's been developed well enough that you don't feel there's a need for further discussion. But when you get to one where you're going to vote against it, you'll speak up. I certainly will. Okay. <laughs> all right. Any further discussion on number one? Okay, all those in favor? Okay, the motion carries. Uh, you get a short one now. Number two. <laughs> Based on the letter of the Portland Water District dated 9-21-2005, the project has sufficient water availability for the reasonably foreseeable needs of the subdivision. So, I'll second that. And Paul has made the motion. Peter has seconded. Any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor? Okay, motion carries. Jack? Number three. Uh, the plan includes a sediment and erosion control plan consistent with best management practices. 
plan will not cause an unreasonable soil erosion or reduction in the capacity of the land to hold water so that a dangerous or unhealthy condition may result. Is there a second? No second. Peter has seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor? The motion carries. And if there's a, if it's not seven, uh, oh, I will state that aloud for the uh, uh, minute secretary. Number, Number four, four, John. The applicants have submitted a traffic study prepared by Tom Goral, professor, professional traffic engineer of Goral Palmer Engineering, and dated October 27, 2005, which analyzes the traffic to be generated by the proposed project. On behalf of the to town, Tom Errico, professional traffic engineer, of Wilbur Smith Associates conducted a peer review of the traffic analysis dated December 9, 2005 and found it consistent with tra standard traffic engineering practice. Both engineers found that with recommended traffic improvements, the project would not create unsafe conditions. The plan will not cause unreasonable highway or public road congestion or unsafe conditions with respect to use of the highways, public roads, or traffic patterns alone or in conjunction with existing or contemplated road use. A motion has been made. Is there a second? Seconded by David. Is there any further discussion? I'd like, to, I'd like to see number four be amended to say that the applicant shall be required to submit a updated traffic study based on the option that is approved and that updated traffic study shall be submitted for the town for their records. Because I do not believe that the, a study has been prepared which analyzes and provides relevant traffic information specifically for the option approved. Um, sorry, I was, who would be required to, the applicant would be required to submit a final traffic study that is consistent with the option that is approved. Yeah, we could make that a condition of approval. Yes, please. Uh, Barbara. I'm voting against this because I think Stevenson and, and, um, and Spruink are, is a very unsafe um, intersection. I realize that traffic engineers have said it. However, we have a traffic engineer right here who said that he was worried about it being a safe intersection. And I, I just think it's too much traffic coming out on small streets and we'll vote against it. You're going to vote against Barbara even with a condition of approval to monitor if the safety issue mm -hmm. arises? Okay. Mm -hmm. Just making sure. Thank you. Any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor of finding effect? <laughs> Excuse me, number four. Against. Okay, the motion carries six to one. Barbara, you're up. Um. Based on the recommendations of Bob Malley, Town Public Works Director and Sewer Superintendent, in his memo dated 3-31-06, the project will provide for adequate sewage waste disposal by utilizing the public sewer system. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Paul. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Motion carries unanimously on finding of fact number five. Mr. Number, Griffin? Number six. The 1988 Visual Resources Assessment Report conducted by the town does not list the project area as a significant scenic area or vista. The project has been designed as an open space zoning subdivision resulting in conservation of most of the 12.58 acres of open space in its natural state as forest and wetlands. Soils and wetlands expert Gail Brewer of Statewide Surveys, Inc. submitted a written report and oral testimony that vernal pool habitat was not located on the property. No historic sites listed in 1993 comprehensive plan are located on the property. The bulk of the wetland shorelines on the site, including all the RP1 wetland, are located within the open space where public access will be permanently preserved the project will not have an undue adverse effect on the, on the scenic or natural beauty of the area. Scenic vistas, aesthetics, wildlife, wildlife habitat, 
historic sites or rare and irreplaceable natural areas or any public rights for physical or visual access to the shoreline. Second. The motion has been made and seconded by Jack. Any further discussion? Barbara. I'm voting against this one too. Um, the most heavily forested part of this parcel is going to be completely clear cut. There are many trees that are greater than 10 inches there, which is a violation of the code. And I do not think that we had to develop this in terms of open space zoning. Again, I think there was another way to do it. So. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? <clears throat> yeah, the motion carries six to one. Uh, we're back to Peter. Seven, based on the recommendation of the town manager, Michael McGovern, in his memorandum dated October 28, 2005, the applicant has adequate financial and technical capacity to meet the above stated standards. Is there a second? <coughs> Seconded by Paul. Further discussion? All those in favor of finding number seven? The motion carries unanimously. Number nine, the project in Excuse, whole. If just one, is it, we've just skipped from seven to nine? Okay, that's fine. We can just, we'll call it nine because that's what it is here. Okay. 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 And number nine, the project whole or in part is within 250 feet of a stream and wetlands as defined in the zoning ordinance. A Department of Environmental Protection stream crossing permit has been issued an application for a resource protection permit for wetland alterations is included in this application. Second. A motion has been made and seconded by Jack. Any further discussion on number nine? All those in favor? Motion carries unanimously. <laughs> number 10. Based on the aquifer mapping in the 1993 comprehensive plan, no aquifer is located in the project area project will not alone or in conjunction with this existing activities adversely affect the quality of groundwater. Motion has been made. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by John. Any further discussion? All those in favor? The gods are angry too. Uh, I don't know. I, did everybody raise his or her hand? I, I'm sorry. Okay. All right. All right. None opposed. Motion carries unanimously. Uh, John, to you. Based on the Federal Emergency Management Agency's flood boundary and floodway maps and flood insurance rate maps, the subdivision is not in a flood-prone area. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by David. Any further discussion on finding of fact number 11? All those in favor? Motion carries unanimously. Okay, Barbara, number 12. Because the project employs a cluster design that reduces road and utility lengths, the project will, not prom will promote energy conservation and efficiency. Second. The motion has been made and seconded. You said the project will promote energy. Oh, well, yeah. Okay. I made a That's fine. Any further discussion? Um, Barbara. I'm going to abstain from this because I'm not really sure that it does save anything. I mean, I don't know that it would be a whole lot different if it was, if there would be fewer roads any other way. I can't tell, so. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor of finding impact number 12? Uh, that's five in favor, I believe. Uh, opposed? One? Abstained? Okay. Five in favor, one opposed, and one abstaining. Thirteen. The town engineer has reviewed the project plans. Uh, can, I, can we just hang on one second? The uh, technical people in the booth, are we coming? Can you hear us? Yes, yes thank you. Mr. Go ahead. Mr. Yes. Chair, just for point of clarification. Okay. I voted against number 12. I do not agree with the statement. Okay. So, you had said five, one, and one. It's actually five. Is it five and two? Or is it? No, five abstains. 
Oh, Barbara Saint. My apologies. I, I didn't hear that. Okay. Thank well, you. it's understandable given yep. the conditions. <laughs> Thank you. David. 13. The town engineer has reviewed the project plans and made recommendations in numerous letters to the planning board to make the road designs for the project comply with the road classification standards table included in the subdivision ordinance. The road classification standards table was created to implement the recommendations for road design in the 1993 comprehensive plan. The proposed roads conform to the comprehensive plan as adopted in whole or in part by the town council. At the direction of the planning board, the applicant has extended the right of way, but not the actual road surface, off South Street to extend to the abutting Maxwell property. Any traffic generated by future development of the Maxwell property would be reviewed under the subdivision ordinance traffic standards. Therefore, analysis of possible additional traffic is premature and not needed at this time. The board has required provision for projection of the roads for access to adjoining property, whether subdivided or not. Motion has been made. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by uh, Peter. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Uh, we have six in favor of finding a fact number 13. All those opposed? One. One opposed. The motion carries. Uh, we're up to number 14, Peter. I'll speak as loudly as I can. Uh, the applicants have submitted a cut-through traffic study prepared by Tom Gorrell, professional traffic engineer of Formal Palmer Engineering, dated February 3rd, 2006. Well, you know what? I'm sorry. I voted on the wrong one. So we're on 14. <laughs> okay. So if we can go back to finding fact number 13, did you intend to vote in favor of that, Barbara? It's understandable. It's hard to hear. <laughs> I'd rather have the breeze, but yeah. if it's getting too difficult. No, yeah, I, I meant to vote for that one. That's okay. seven. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, no, that's okay. I, you want uh, to take the vote again? Or? No, so. I, I'm sorry. That's now okay. we're on 14. I apologize. That's okay. I'm finding a fact number 13. The vote is 7 to 0. In favor. You ready? Yes. Um. I'm just going to start again. The applicants have submitted a cut-through traffic study prepared by Tom Gorrell, professional traffic engineer of Coral Parma Engineering, dated February 3rd, 2006, that analyzes cut-through traffic that would occur if no emergency gate were installed between Mitchell Road and Spurwink Avenue. Mm. On behalf of the town, Tom Errico, professional traffic engineer of Wilbur Smith Associates, conducted a peer review of the traffic analysis dated February 15, 2006, and found it consistent with the traffic standard engineering practice, standard traffic engineering practice. Both engineers found that there would not be significant cut through traffic. And I've, I've actually edited this to reflect option A. Go ahead. The most recently submitted plans include the installation of an emergency access gate which would prohibit cut through traffic presently on Chicory Way on the submission plan entitled Option A Gate Plan. Local roads are laid out so their use by through traffic is discouraged and that the roads are designed to, so as to provide safe, convenient, and attractive access from the subdivision to previously existing or proposed public ways and includes two or more means of such vehicular access. So on the table is the option A plan. Okay. Motion has been made. Is there a second? David Griffin seconds. Is there, we have discussed this at <laughs> length, but is, is there any further discussion? Uh, yeah, I, I was favoring option B, but I will vote for option A because I believe it's a satisfactory solution for the problem at hand. Any further discussion? So all those in favor of finding a fact number 14? Uh, five in favor. Opposed? 
Two opposed. The motion carries. Uh, we're up to number 15, Paul. Based on the plans which show preservation of naturally vegetated buffers and open space and additional plantings where existing vegetation will not be preserved during construction, plants or other types of vegetated cover are preserved to place throughout and around the perimeter of the proposed subdivision. They provide for an adequate buffer, reduction of noise and light, separation between the subdivision and abutting properties, and enhancement of its appearance. The, the mo motion has been made, Jack. Seconded. Sorry, I didn't hear. Uh, okay. Uh, Paul made the motion, Jack Keneally seconded. Is there any further discussion on number 15? I just want to chime in. One of the issues that was before us was whether we felt that it would be appropriate to require additional buffering along the Macaulay Road area, the, 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 essentially the backyards of the Darlings and a few of the other abutters. Based on the site walk that I saw, I did not believe that, that was necessary uh, for this project. And I believe I stated that on the record last time, but I just wanted to be sure it was on the record. Any further discussion? All those in favor of finding in fact number 15? Six in favor. All those opposed? One opposed. The motion carries. Uh, Jack? Number 16. No off-road parking lots, storage areas, rubbish disposal areas, or similar improvements exposed to public roads or to potential areas are proposed. Is there a second? Seconded by John Siegfried. Any further discussion? All those in favor of finding in fact number 16. Motion carries 7 to 0. Number 17, the proposed roads have been reviewed by the town engineer and found in compliance with the road classification standards table. The road classification standards table was created to promote road construction that pre preserves neighborhood character and consistent with the comprehensive plan. The proposed roads are laid out in an attractive manner in order to enhance the livability and amenity of the subdivision, conform to existing topography, and minimize cuts and fills. Uh, the motion has been made by John, seconded by uh, Peter Hatem. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Okay, motion with respect to finding in fact number 17 carries 7 to 0. Uh, Barbara, number 18. Building envelopes have been created with setbacks from property lines resulting in no shading of proposed or existing structures from adjacent structures. The proposed subdivision design has considered protecting and assuring access to direct sunlight locating structures so as to minimize shading of either existing or proposed <coughs> structures. Okay. There's been a motion on finding number 18. Is there a seconded by John Siegfried? Any further discussion? Barbara. I'd say there sure isn't going to be any shading because there aren't going to be any trees. Well, I disagree with that, but uh, I'll nevertheless uh, plan to vote in favor of number 18. Any further discussion? All those in favor? We have five in favor. Uh, all those opposed? Abstain. Okay. Uh, so five in favor, one opposed, one abstaining on finding of fact number 18. Uh, David. Number 19, the subdivision is not designed as a traditional grid system. Lock lengths do exceed 1,000 feet to suit the topography and character of the subdivision and to avoid an awkward road pattern or detrimental effect to adjacent property. Motion has been made, is there a second? Seconded by Paul Godfrey. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion with respect to finding number 19. Motion carries unanimously 7 to 0. Uh, Peter. Um, finding fact number 20, based on the comments of Police Chief Neil Williams in his memo dated November 5th, 2005. Road names have been used which do not duplicate or may be confused with the names of existing roads. Second. Okay, motion has been made and seconded by uh, 
made by Peter Hayden, seconded by Paul. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Okay, it's unanimous with respect to finding number 20. Finding effect number 21, the applicant has submitted a stormwater plan prepared by Grohl Palmer Consulting Engineers, Inc. that has been pre reviewed and accepted by town engineer Steve Harding of Oast Associates <coughs> as in compliance with the town stormwater ordinance. The subdivision involves more than 10,000 square feet of impervious surface, paving, clearing, or vegetative alteration and complies with the provisions and improvements for the control of stormwater runoff governed by Chapter 18 Article 2, Stormwater Control Ordinance. Drainage easements have been provided where channeling surface water within such subdivision on private property will require town maintenance. Second. A motion is made by Paul, seconded by Jack Neely. Any further discussion? All those in favor? It is unanimous with respect to finding the fact number 21. Number 22. In lieu of providing pedestrian easements, in the area where trails are proposed will be conveyed to the town of Cape Elizabeth in fee ownership. Motion has been made by Jack. Is there a second? Seconded by John. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Motion with respect to finding number 22 carries unanimously. Number 23, finding the fact. For open space zoning subdivisions located in the RC district, the minimum lot size is 7,500 square feet, and the smallest proposed lot is 7,512 square feet. The lots are configured to orient to the proposed road. The area and the widths of the lot conform to the requirements of the zoning ordinance, including side lot lines at right angles or radial to road lines. Second. A motion was made by John Siegfried and seconded by Jack Keneally. Any further discussion on finding number 23? All those in favor? It's uh, unanimous. As shown on the plan, each property is provided with vehicular access to each lot by an abutting public or private road. Motion has been made by Barbara. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Paul. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Finding a fact, the motion with respect to finding a fact number 24 carries unanimously. Uh, number 25? Yes. The project plan has been based on the open space zoning requirements of section 19-7-2 development. It's clustered on one side of the site and most of the 12.58 acres of open space is located on the other side of the project to maximize its value and protection as a natural area. Single family and condominium residential housing is proposed in an area of existing single family homes and undeveloped land. Plus the development has been designed, sited, and laid out as to minimize disturbance of the existing topography and ground cover, provide maximum usable natural or improved open space, reflect imaginative use of the site, and, the and be compatible with any surrounding land uses and their character. Second. Motion has been made by David and seconded by uh, Paul Godfrey. Is there any discussion? OK. Uh, I would just like to chime in here. I, I know that there are several people probably here tonight wondering why I would be inclined to vote in favor of this. And when I look at the cluster zoning uh, section of our ordinance, I believe it is one of the best and most effective ways to preserve open space in our community. And we have had a workshop where the town planner went through this issue with all the members of the planning board. I do think this is an effective way to preserve open space. I know some people here, including Barbara tonight, have been advocating for a traditional subdivision plan. Uh, to date, we have not uh, been able to create open space through a traditional subdivision plan. That requirement has not been imposed on an applicant uh, ever, as, as far as I am aware. Uh, and I believe this is the most effective way to preserve as much open space as we can. Um, so I am inclined to vote in favor of this. Go ahead, Barbara. Uh, I'll just respond and say that I don't always think that open space zoning isn't a good idea. I think it is a good idea. 
but I don't happen to think it's a good idea in this instance. And to say that there wouldn't have been any open space if we'd had a more traditional development that had restrictive covenants to preserve more trees is inaccurate because they would have had to have open space. In fact, if you remember, we did see a plan of a traditional subdivision which we could have worked on and it did have open space. All the RP1 and RP2 would have been preserved and then there was more preserved around that too. So that's not really, I respectfully disagree with what you're saying. And um, yeah, I am going to vote against this. But I, I do want it made clear that I do not think that open space zoning is a bad idea in concept. I've given this a lot of thought and time and effort. I just don't think it's the right selection for this particular piece of land because of where it is. Okay, thank you. Any further discussion? All those in favor of finding a fact number 25. Uh, we have five in favor. Opposed? Abstain. One opposed and one abstaining. So the motion carries with respect to finding number 25. <clears throat> Okay, number 26. I don't, Peter, is it to you? Yes. It's not even applicable. Is it even applicable anymore? Well, because within the existing subdivision. Mm -hmm. The answer is yes, I think so. Yes. Great. Number 26, per the proposed plan and in an effort to blend the new development with the existing neighborhood, sidewalks and or curbing have been provided where they are necessary for maintenance and public safety. Second. Okay. Peter has made the motion. It's been seconded by John. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Oh, I guess. I don't know. Motion carries unanimously with respect to finding number 26. All? Finding of fact number 27, 12.5 acres of open space, including the only RP1 wetland on the site, will be permanently preserved and donated to the town. Through this open space dedication, the applicant, whenever practical, has preserved natural features just as water courses or bodies, existing trees of 10 inches or more in diameter, base height, marshes, swamps, or other areas identified on the official wetlands map, open space, scenic points, historic spots, and the unusual or striking topographic features which add to the attractiveness of the subdivision. The applicant has agreed to dedicate open space to the town itself, conveyed through appropriate legal instruments under review by the town attorney. Second. Motion has been made by Paul and seconded by David Griffin. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion with respect to number 27. We have five in favor, one opposed. Abstain. Okay, the motion carries. Um, Jeff? Number 28. The applicant will donate 12.58 acres of open space to the town in compliance with the open space zoning provisions. Section 19-7-2, the open space impact fee. Not sure I get this. The open space impact fee alone require an open space dedication of 12,937 square feet per lot or unit, or a total of 12.47 acres. The applicant will donate, donate land to comply with the open space impact fee. The motion has been made. Is there a second? Second. second. I, I guess I stumbled a little bit when I, just for discussion purposes, I stumbled a little bit when I read this. It's a little, a little uh, poorly worded, I think. It sounds uh, My understanding is that the land donation of 12.58 acres will satisfy the applicant's obligations and there would not be a requirement of an open space impact fee. Is that correct? Actually, you have to meet both standards. Okay. Uh, under the open space impact fee, with 42 lots and units, you need 12.47 acres. Uh, the applicant is donating 12.58. Okay. So there is compliance. There is compliance. Okay. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion with respect to finding number 28? The motion carries unanimously. Finding the fact 29, proposed deeds have been submitted that prohibit development on the donated open space. 
common open space to be dedicated by the applicant shall be maintained to ensure that its use and enjoyment is not diminished or destroyed with the applicant submitting written documents identifying that the town shall own the land and be responsible for, for said maintenance. Is there a second? Okay, the motion was made by John and seconded by David Griffin. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? Okay, it's unanimous with respect to finding number 29. Barbara. Uh, 30, the plans show that the project will be served by public sewer and no subsurface disposal systems are proposed for the disposal of sewage for the development. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Paul. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Okay, with respect to finding number 30. Uh, David? Finding of fact 31, no significant wildlife habitat has been identified by Dale Brewer, licensed soil scientist hired by the applicant during his visits to the property. Mr. Brewer, commented specifically that he has visited the site during April when vernal pools can be identified and he did not identify any vernal pools. The project makes adequate provisions for the protection of wildlife, habitat, and fisheries area, which may include but, not, but are not limited to the maintenance of wildlife travel lanes and the preservation and buffering of wildlife habitat areas from proposed development activities. Second. A motion has been made by David and seconded by Paul. Is there any further discussion? Well, I don't think other than vernal pools we ever talked about this. So I don't know that we know. Can you repeat that? I didn't hear it. I said I don't think we ever really talked about this other than vernal pools when Dale Brewer came and told us there were no vernal pools. But as far as wildlife habitat and fishery areas and wildlife, there aren't any fishery areas, but wildlife habitat, I don't think we ever talked about it. So I don't think from my standpoint that I know. I mean, I don't know what the answer to this is, so I'll abstain from it. But never mind, I'm confusing everybody. Go ahead, David. Uh, for the record, I do remember talking to Dale Brewer on the site walk about vernal pools and the fact that he did not. No, we did talk about vernal pools. Yeah. He came here. But, but I did do that on the site walk also. I asked him that question. Uh, your point is, Barbara, the wildlife habitat, not the. I, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't think I can vote on it because I don't know. I'm just saying that from my own standpoint. <clears throat> I don't recall there being a discussion that there were any significant wildlife habitat habitats within this area. Um, clearly, people have mentioned in, our, in their letters to us there are deer, for example, that run through the area. But I, I don't believe there has been anything that I can recall. Maybe the town planner can correct me if maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm misinterpreting the word significant. Maybe <clears throat> that's the answer to the question. Well, yes. Uh, and yeah, OK. I mean, I guess what I would refer to is, and Barbara, you'll forgive me, but the Comprehensive Plan Committee is currently working on the Comprehensive Plan, our most current chapters, the Critical Natural Areas chapter, and the maps that we've received from the state do not show any critical wildlife okay. in this Okay, I'll accept now. that. Thank you. Is there any further discussion with respect to finding number 31? All those in favor of the motion? Pose of actually carries unanimously. I'm afraid I forgot the lineup. Are we back, Peter? Yes. Thank you. 32. Based on the plans and requirements of the addressing ordinance, the numbering of the individual residential dwelling units will be clearly visible. Signs clearly identifying the house numbers in each set of dwelling units will be placed along the road leading to each set of units. Is there a second? That's a contract. Seconded by David. Well, it almost didn't get seconded. Uh, <laughs> any, further, any further discussion? All those in favor of finding 32? It carries unanimously. Uh, Paul? Finding of fact number 33, the applicant has submitted letters from Central Maine Power, Time Warner Cable, 
in the Portland Water District regarding provision of services to the subdivision. All utilities, including but not limited to the provision of water, gas, which is not applicable in this area of Cape Elizabeth, and electricity is adequate for the proposed development. Second. Okay, the motion was made by Paul and seconded by Jack. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion with respect to finding number 33? Uh, it's unanimous. Number 34, the proposed project made up of single-family homes, condominium units, and open space is harmonious with the surrounding single-family neighborhoods and undeveloped land. A motion was made by Jack and seconded by John. Any further discussion? I believe this is an issue that there has been a great deal of discussion about. Uh, I think there's further explanation that will come in the next finding of fact as well. Um, but I believe this has been clearly established on the record. Any further discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous with respect to finding of fact number 34. Finding of fact number 35, the adjacent Mitchell Highland subdivision constructed in 1965 and 1966 was a 25-acre parcel where 46 home lots were created and one acre of land was donated to the town. The adjacent South Portland Estates neighborhood was recorded in 1925. 137 lots were created with an average lot size of 5,000 square feet. No open space was preserved and the majority of the lots are not developed. The proposed project, a 25-acre lot with 42 lots units proposed and 12.57 acres of permanently protected open space is compatible with the density of the adjacent neighborhoods. Second. The motion has been made by John and seconded by Jack. Uh, Paul? Uh, Mr. Chair's point of clarification is a 12.57 or 12.58. Uh, let so it shows up. Okay. 12.58? Yes. Thank you, John. Uh, you want to amend the, the motion then to reflect that it's 12.58 acres? Is that acceptable to you, John? It's acceptable. Okay. <laughs> Any further discussion? All those in favor of finding effect number 35 as amended? Uh, six in favor. Opposed? One opposed. Uh, Barbara, it's to you. Uh, the wetland alterations shown on the plan include culverts to maintain water flows where wetlands are altered. The project will not materially obstruct the flow of surface or subsurface waters across from the alteration area. The motion has been made. Is there a second? <coughs> second. Seconded by Paul. Is there any further discussion? No. Oh, okay. All those in favor? Motion with respect to finding number 36 carries unanimously. Finding of fact 37, based on the storm water management plan prepared and reviewed by professional licensed civil engineers, the project will not impound surface waters or reduce the absorbed capacity of the alteration area so as to cause or increase the flooding of adjacent properties. Motion has been made by David Griffin. Is there a second? A second. Seconded by John Siegfried. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion with respect to finding number 37? Motion carries unanimously. Finding number 38. Based on the stormwater management plan prepared by Goral Palmer Engineering and reviewed by Steve Harding, professional engineer with Oast Associates, the project will not increase the flow of surface waters across or the discharge of surface waters from the alteration area so as to threaten injury to the alteration area or to upstream and or downstream lands by flooding, draining, erosion, sedimentation, or otherwise. Motion has been made. Is there a second? Seconded by John. Any further discussion with respect to finding number 38? All those in favor of the motion? Motion carries unanimously with respect to finding number 38. Finding of fact number 39. Based on the testimony and report submitted by Dale Brewer, resulting from his visits to the project site, his training and experience in identifying sensitive wetland habitats, and his conclusion that vernal pools do not exist on the site, the project will not result in significant damage to spawning grounds or habitat for aquatic life, birds, or other wildlife. Second. 
Motion was made by Paul and seconded by Jack. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion with respect to finding number 39. Uh, sorry, I didn't quite, is all those in favor of finding number 39? Okay, it's seven to zero, thank you. Finding a fact number 40. The project does not propose to construct structures in wetland areas. Infrastructure that crosses wetlands is designed with a gravel base to support the structure, which has been reviewed and accepted by town engineer Steve Harding. The project will not pose problems related to the support of structures. Motion has been made. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by David Griffin. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion with respect to finding number 40? It is unanimous. Finding of fact number 41, the project area does not include coastal dunes or contiguous back dune areas. Is there a second? second? Seconded by Paul. Any further discussion with respect to finding number 41? All those in favor of the motion? Carries unanimously. The plans, uh, finding of fact number 42, the plans include preservation of open space to reserve to be preserved in its natural state through a conservation restriction included in the deed of the land to the town. The project uh, will maintain or improve ecological and aesthetic values. Okay, is there a second? I'll second? Seconded by John. Is there any further discussion with respect to I finding I have a question. 42, yes, Barbara. Um, is that throughout or just in the open space? Does that mean the entire project will maintain or improve ecological and aesthetic values, or just the open space will maintain or improve ecological values? I believe the finding suggests that the project meets the goal of maintaining or improving ecological values by the preservation of the open space. Okay, thank you. Is there any further discussion or questions on the motion with respect to finding number 42? Did I say who's that? Okay, thank you. All those in favor? Uh, we have five in favor. Opposed? Two opposed. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I get the count right? I thought it was Jack, Keneally, and Barbara. Opposed. I just left my hand up too long. Oh, I see. <laughs> I wanted to go to sleep. All right, thank you. Um, David, you're up. Finding of fact number 44, the plans include... Oh, excuse me, I think we're on, still at, we're on 43. 43. We're on 40, I'm sorry. It's okay. Finding of fact 43, the plans show that no activity will occur within 100 feet of the RP1 wetland except for trails which are permitted use in the RP1 buffer. The project will maintain an adequate buffer area between the wetland and the adjacent land uses. Second. And the motion has been made by David Griffin, seconded by Paul. Any further discussion with respect to finding number 43? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Finding 44, the plans include an erosion and sediment control plan reviewed and found acceptable by the town engineer, Steve Harding. The project will be accomplished in conformance with the erosion prevention provisions, provisions of environmental quality Handbook Erosion and Sediment Control, published by the Maine Soil and Water Conservation Commission, dated March 1986, or sub subsequent revisions thereof. Motion has been made. Is there a second? Seconded by David Griffin. Is there any further discussion with respect to finding number 44? All those in favor of the motion? It's unanimous. Finding of fact number 45. Public Works Director, acting as Sewer <coughs> Superintendent, and the Town Engineer have revised and found acceptable the sewer infrastructure construction plans. The project will be accomplished without discharging wastewater from buildings or from other construction into wastewater treatment facilities in violation of Section 15-1-4 of the Sewerage Ordinance. Second. Okay. Motion has been made by Paul and seconded by Jack. Is there any further discussion with respect to finding number 45? All those in favor of the motion, it carries unanimously. 
Finding of Fact Number 46. The project plans include amendments to the South Portland Estate Subdivision and the Mitchell Highlands Subdivision to remove lots from those subdivisions and add that area to the Spurwink Wood Subdivision. Amended subdivision plans referencing the book and page of the original subdivision recording have been submitted for Planning Board signature. The Planning Board finds that these subdivision amendments do comply with the subdivision ordinance standards, section 16-1-1 and section 16-3-1. Is there a second? Okay, the motion has been made and second. It was, excuse me, made by Jack and seconded by David Griffin. Is there any further discussion with respect to finding number 46? All those in favor of the motion? Uh, six in favor, opposed? I'm abstaining. Abstaining, okay. The motion carries on finding number 46. Finding number 47, the 1993 comprehensive plan includes a growth areas map and a rural protection area map. The growth areas map includes the project site and an infill growth area. The rural protection area map shows areas where trails should be provided on lots that are not in the designated rural protection areas. The rural protection areas map shows that two trails should be provided on the project site. Based on the trails proposed, be constructed by the applicant and deeded to the town for public access, the planning board finds that the project conforms to the comprehensive plan growth and rural area maps. The motion has been made. It's been seconded, it's been seconded by Paul. Uh, is there any further discussion? I believe one of the abutters in a recent email or letter we received uh, stated that this area was in a rural protection area, and I believe that is not the case. Uh, I don't think it's the case, no. I, I mean, I've looked at that map. It's, this lot is clearly in the growth areas map, and there are dots for this lot on the rural protection areas map. But the rural protection areas map <coughs> shows a double dotted line through a lot of properties, and I believe that if you look at it, you can see that the dots on this property are intended to show that there should be trails preserved on it, not that the whole lot should be preserved. That, that was my understanding as well. Is there any further discussion on 47? All those in favor of the motion? The motion carries unanimously with respect to finding number 47. Uh, finding number 48, the plans have been revised to eliminate three water detention retention bases in favor of utilizing level lip spreaders combined with a naturally vegetated buffer in an RP1 wetland. The application of the older DEP regulation facilitates the substitution of the basins for the level lip spreader approach, which has been encouraged by the DEP and supported by the town engineer's review. The planning board finds that the application of the older DEP stormwater regulations does adequately protect natural resources and adverse impacts to downstream properties. Okay, is there a second? Second. second. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, Jack seconded the motion. Oh, 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 have we voted? Uh, no, we haven't voted. I, is there, I it was the second. I'm sorry. I, I, did I get a, Did I get the second right? Was it? I, I didn't second it. I think Paul second. I have a question. David Griffin seconded, but there seems like now people want to have a discussion. So go ahead, Peter. I, I'm just trying to understand that the, the older regulations were the basins instead <clears> of the level lip spreaders. So we're making a finding by Barbara's motion that the older regulations do or do not adequately protect natural resources. We want the application of the newer regulations. Isn't that correct? The, the application currently has been submitted under the old DEP regulations. And under those regulations, they look at quantity only. And the town's regulations look at quantity only. And the applicant has made a case that without the basins, they can still make okay. work with quantity only. But the applicant did state that if they came in under the new DEP regulations, the new regulations look at quality only. And you still have the town regulations at quantity only. So, you know, the finding may be a little off because the applicant's, uh, what his statement is, and I believe it's accurate because I was at the same DEP meeting, is that it really doesn't matter because either way, the applicant, what the applicant is proposing deals with a quality issue, okay. even though neither the DEP old regulations nor the town's regulations really aggressively go after that. Um, however, the DEP was sitting in the room and said that 
you know, the use of naturally vegetated buffers and their specific recommendation was rain gardens is really what the new regulations are going at. So old, new, it probably makes little difference. Okay. Any further discussion or questions? Okay, we had a motion then with respect to finding of fact number 48. All of those in favor? Carries unanimously. Uh, finding of fact 49, the plans include preservation of 12.57 acres. Should that be 12.58? Yes. Of open space, most of that forested. The open space will be permanently preserved through deed restriction and donated to the town of Cape Elizabeth. The portion of the uh, property to be developed is also forested and includes large mature trees. The proposed development will require the clearing of large trees greater than 10 inches in diameter. The planning board finds that the project plans do preserve natural features and existing trees of 10 inches or more in diameter whenever practical. Second. A motion has been made by David Griffin and seconded by John. Is there any further discussion? Uh, I just wanted to add a question for the town planner. The, with respect to the preservation of existing trees of 10 inches or more in diameter, is the ordinance, is the requirement of the ordinance that it be done wherever practical? Yes, the standard says whenever practical. You are to preserve trees of 10 inches or more in diameter. Di diameter. It does not have an exclusive prohibition against removing trees that are 10 inches or more in diameter. Okay. Can I ask another question? Yes. Um, the ordinance requires that whenever practical, it's very open-ended. Is there any criteria of what's practical and what's not? No. I think I'm going to take advantage of the attendance of the town attorney to answer that one. <laughs> uh, I don't know of any case law that really uh, addresses this particular point, but um, I, in my opinion, it, whenever practicable would mean that it, you know, if, if you're approving it with a house lot or a building envelope and it has some larger trees on it, you, you can take those down, but to the, uh, the extent you could form a building envelope to protect them, that would be, um, the, the, you know, to the extent practicable. You, you could still get the house on the lot, and you could, you could do that. Um, well, let me ask a question of the town attorney. Um, does this wording have any influence on the decision to clear quite a lot before development as opposed to you know, really trying very hard to preserve all 10 inch trees around the building envelope. I, I guess I would say that if, if you couldn't put a home on the property without taking down the trees, then um, you should be, the developer would be allowed to take down those trees if, if the, um, if, if you can put in the house without having to take down those trees, then that's what, that's what the, the way the ordinance is worded, that's what you should be doing. It just seems like a very soft... Um, it is very soft. It's a very soft standard. But... Um, I, I guess that's, a, that's a, as best I can answer that. Okay, thank you. Again, I'm not aware, at least in my term on the planning board, where we have imposed a requirement on a developer or an applicant to mark the exact trees that would be preserved or not preserved. I'm not sure I'm prepared to go that route here either. But it, uh, I don't know if anyone has any further thoughts on that. Okay, we have a motion with respect to, thank you. Okay. A motion with respect to finding number 49. All those in favor of the motion? Five. Opposed? Abstain. Okay. Motion carries five to one with one abstention. I think we are, are we back to you? We are, and I'm, I'm prepared to wrap it all up in one. Okay. 
and that will incorporate some of the conditions that we've discussed previously? Right. Okay. I've made some edits and I'll get the edits to the town Okay. Do you need a minute or? Uh, you'll set. I'll get one more to add. Can I, can, I, can I have a right. mercy break of about three minutes for a bathroom visit? <laughs> I, so moved. Yeah, that's fine. We'll take, we'll take a quick three-minute break. Uh, thank you. Yeah. It's also 11-1 Red Sox. Oh. <laughs> it's 11-1. 